We are um, back on the subject of pre-K, and I am really delighted to uh, start the conversation with Meg Baker. Um, yeah, so come and just stick your name and give us your testimony. All right. Uh, so thank you um, for inviting me here today. Um, I am the Act 166, the Universal Pre-K Coordinator for Addison County. Um, our, we have three districts, or three um, school districts within our region that have collaborated to form this position. So that's Addison Central School District, which is the Middlebury area, uh, Mount Abraham Unified School District, which is the Bristol area, and Addison Northwest School District, which is the Virgins area. Um, 17 towns, um, and we have um, roughly um, 430 or so children who are served by pre-K. Almost 80% of those kids are served in private programs outside of the schools. Um, currently, we have, I, I've written 29, but in the past uh, three days, we've signed three additional contracts, so it's actually now 32 uh, community-based pre-K programs, uh, including center and home-based programs. Um, so we've seen a lot of strengths for universal pre-K in our region. Locally, Act 166 has increased our pre-K participation. Um, in the year um, before Universal Pre-K was implemented, we served 228 children between our three districts with publicly funded Pre-K. And as I said before, this is now up to 430 children. Um, we've also seen an increase in quality. We've seen uh, the number of programs with a licensed early educator uh, and STARS quality ratings of three or more has risen as a direct result of pre-K. At least nine local programs have either increased their STARS rating or um, hired or filled a vacancy with a licensed teacher in order to be able to contract with the district. Um, right now we, are, we have, um, and these are in, within our district, we have 14 licensed community programs, three home-based programs, and uh, six school-based programs that are pre-qualified. One of the strengths that we've identified is consistency, uh, partially because of our regional administration. We developed, um, beginning back in 2015 and 2016, one central contract timeline uh, and attendance uh, and enrollment paperwork. Um, and in the past year or so, we I've been working with other regions in our state to further align contracts um, and uh, practices so that we are more consistent with what's happening in um, Chittenden County and White River Valley uh, so that we've got a crosswalk and we are trying to refine our language to be more uh, consistent. We found that meeting family needs, um, families appreciate the portability of uh, the tuition and the variety of choices that are available. We have full-time, full-year programs. We also have um, part-time pre-K programs. Uh, there's schools, there's homes, um, and there's programs with a variety of philosophies. Um, the information about children has also been helpful in terms of school budgeting and kindergarten transition, um, knowing more about the kids who are coming up. The, another strength has been our increased public-private partnerships, uh, thinking about um, awareness of early learning standards and um, child progress. We held a kindergarten transition summit a few years back and developed um, uh, some uh, coordination between pre-K teachers and kindergarten teachers around what does kindergarten readiness look like and what information is helpful to kindergarten teachers as children are moving up. So it's not just TS goal child progress, but also who should this child be placed with, who shouldn't this child be placed with. Um, 
We've looked at collaborative professional development opportunities. We've used uh, some of our TS Gold data to think about um, what, what is the data telling us about where we need to spend more time. Um, and as a result of that, we've formed some um, professional learning communities and communities of practice. Um, we're offering professional development on the pyramid model, the social emotional pyramid model, to our private programs. We and we've also offered to mathematics. Um, and as I mentioned before, regional administration has been um, a key component of that. Um, we, like others in the state, have seen some limits to. Um, the universal pre-K law. One of those pieces does have to do with capacity. Although we have good capacity in our um, region to serve in terms of the number of spots for children, we have families have very disparate needs in terms of schedules and locations and program characteristics. And so what that means is that occasionally transportation is a barrier, um, finding mid-year openings for kids who come to our um, homeless shelter, which doesn't open until mid-October in Middlebury, those kinds of things has been a real challenge. Um, it generally works out, but that is one of the limitations that we've seen. Um, special education portability, I know you've heard some testimony, um, has been um, a challenge. The districts have a finite pool of resources, and um, although they're meeting the needs, um, it does continue to be a challenge. Um, equity, um, we anecdotally have seen that um, at-risk students seem to be concentrated into certain programs. I would say that that's both school-based programs and some of our full-time, um, full-year programs, depending on family needs, um, and that other programs are less accessible. And it, it's something that I think that there needs to be additional data and research done on. Um, Dual administration um, has been a major concern. Um, having both the agency and uh, of education and the CDD responsible has been unwieldy for both community programs and school-based programs. And it's also very unclear sometimes how school-age policies like the McKinney-Vento Homeless Education Act might impact pre-K and um, ELL services, other kinds of services like that. And it's something that I hope that as you look at a bifurcation of the system, that you consider how issues like that will be resolved for individual students. Um, the, sorry, I've lost my place here. Um, the local administrative concerns. Um, have been very challenging. Administrative costs are high, right? I mean, my position exists specifically to manage this law. Um, and the other piece is that there is no recourse for schools. Schools are mandated to partner. And if a program doesn't um, return paperwork or doesn't obey the law, um, we've gotten limited guidance from the state around those. And we don't have a lot of recourse that is built into our ability to negotiate on those issues. Um, quality that assurance? Even if we buy, that, that remains even if we buy I think it would. If, if school districts are mandated to partner with a qualified program, then what then there needs to be some sort of recourse for what do you do if a, if a program is not living up to their side. Say they don't give you the attendance information that you need in order to be able to count those kids in your census. Or um, they uh, the quality monitoring piece around calendars um, or having a licensed educator on staff. If there are concerns, a school district needs to have some kind of negotiation power to, to discontinue their contracts or discontinue their funding or renegotiate what those, those situations look like. And that is a challenge at the moment. Um, 
Uh, so, and then quality assurance that sort of feeds into that same piece, right? If, if school districts are in the, res the place right now of needing to monitor for pre-K compliance with Act 166, and there has not been significant guidance from the state around um, those pieces. It also creates some real budgetary and ethical issues if a school, if a program loses their licensed teacher mid-year, for example. Do you discontinue the tuition funding for those children mid-year, knowing that the cost then is going to be passed on to those families? Fortunately, that's not been a situation that we've had to get to, but we've come close a couple of times. It also creates all kinds of issues for school budgets at that point because you count it, you're counting kids and then you suddenly aren't able to count them. Um, the lack of early educators has been a concern. Uh, there's currently insufficient numbers of licensed educators to fully meet the demand. Peer review processes are backed up. Um, and provisional licenses are not available for early educators in uh, community programs. Um, the other piece I would say is in terms of transparency. Um, families don't understand how the pre-K is involved, how the public funds and the education fund is involved in funding in for their tuition payments. And so that can lead to confusion for families in there and how that um, that funding is applied, especially if there are question marks about families moving districts or um, needing services beyond the hours of pre-K. Um, the creation of regions, geographic regions, uh, in some districts has been confusing and very frustrating for uh, many of our local programs and families. We have uh, a a uh, geographic region just to our south, and many of the families come north to programs in our area. Um, and a number of, of those families have been denied tuition to programs in our area. And what typically happens in that situation is the families continue with that program and either uh, they're paying more or the private programs are using their limited resources to provide scholarships for those families and um, or a combination thereof. So just to clarify, these are people that are outside of your district in the district down there so they reside. Did, that did not include yours. That's exactly right. So um, the region just to our south, um, which encompasses um, a little bit of Addison County, so the Leicester, Brandon area, they have a geographic region where uh, students may only be served within uh, their school district. Um, and families can uh, request that the, um, the funding be, be delivered to private programs up in our region, and um, that has not happened, um, to my knowledge, ever. Um, and so that has been very frustrating for, for families who have their children enrolled in, in a full-time program, and some of them, you know, for legitimate reasons, need their kids closer to where they work or in a full-time, full-year program or with their siblings. Um, so that has been complicated. Um, the other piece around uh, limitations is the hours of pre-K. Um, most early childhood educators would agree that 10 hours a week is insufficient to fully meet learning goals um, and to see significant progress. Um, and um, it's a challenge for working families as well. Um, if there was a waiting or tuition system that promoted a minimum of 10 hours a week, um, but uh, incentivized a more full day program, that might be um, something that um, would incentivize more full time programming. Um, five year olds. Um, we, there's been a lot of back and forth about kindergarten eligible children. Um, I would love to see, because I think that there are situations in which children do need to be retained for an additional year in pre-K and that the schools should be involved in that decision. I'd love to see a, a retention policy, right, that is comparable to what we might see in a kindergarten through 12th grade 
So it's not limited to currently we have the language limited to an IEP. You're saying. So in most of the situations that we have had kids retained, they've had an IEP. Um, we rarely have kids who are on a 504. Um, but there are some situations in which children with late summer birthdays, for example, might benefit from an additional year um, in a less structured environment. And um, similar to retaining kids in other um, other grades, there are times that I would recommend that for a pre-K child. As opposed to two years of kindergarten? Rarely do we see two years of kindergarten. No, no. But um, I think that two years of kindergarten might be the right choice for some children. It's also kindergarten programs are more structured at, than, than pre-K programs. And in the same way that you, that if a child's not ready to move into that level of structure, it's possible that um, a district might want to keep them in a pre-K program. Um, and then the last piece is there's been a lot of um, back and forth um, in terms of requirements at the state level. There's been statewide memos. There's been... Um, no offense to anybody in the room, but lots of legislative conversation um, about pre-K, and that's made the whole system feel pretty unstable for um, districts and pre-K programs alike. And so I think that has been a real challenge. Um, and in general, knowing how we're going to move forward and having some guidance around creating those needed policies is a key and critical need from this point forward. Um, Very stop you on that. Yeah. Um, you, you sort of list three areas of uncertainty that are hanging out there. Mm -hmm. uh, one of which is legislative conversations about potential changes. Yep. Where does that rank in that list of three? <laughs> uh, I, I would say. Um, the things that have caused the most immediate furor in the have been the statewide memos from the from the agency of education that have come out that that have changed things immediately. The things that create the most long term instability, instability, right? That feeling of I don't know where we're going to be next year. That's mm -hmm. the legislative piece. Um, so. Um, the last piece, this is our pre-K enrollment um, over the past um, several years, um, and it says 2014 through 15, um, Addison Northeast, which is now Mount Abraham Unified School District, was an early adopter of the program, so you can see a slight bump there, and then when Addison Central and Addison Northwest joined is where we saw the largest increases, and now it appears to have leveled out in terms of enrollment. Um, so the other piece that I wanted to bring up was some specific comments and about the draft Great. that I saw. Um, and I know it's just a draft. Um, and I think you've gone a long ways towards looking at what some of the concerns are and compromise. Um, the, there were a couple of questions that came to mind for me. Um, the first piece is around pre-K eligibility and monitoring. It looks as though you've removed pre-qualification from that bill. But now it seems a little unclear who is establishing and monitoring that private program eligibility for partnership. Um, and specifically, I want to make sure that, if, that if, if districts are responsible for the monitoring of those private pre-K programs, that they have the ability to modify um, contracts, right? Because that's in there as well, that there's going to be a uniform contract piece. But if districts don't have the ability to modify that for specific circumstances and they're responsible for the monitoring, it could put districts in a tricky place. Um, the other pieces around uniform processes. Yeah. I think what we have is we have the AOE monitoring public and private AHS monitoring private. Okay. I also ask you as a monitoring as well. Yeah. Right. So, so that was current draft. Okay. So yeah. so when the SUs are monitoring the district programs, is that the way it's written? Okay. So it wasn't clear to me in that draft mm -hmm. if they were just monitoring the district programs, or if they were responsible for the monitoring of other programs as well. Okay. Um, so that does help clarify. Um, 
in terms of the uniform forms and processes, I think it's fabulous to try to align pieces. I do think that there are specific circumstances in which districts do need to make um, uh, the, the uh, modifications. I even think about things like the birth date. The kindergarten entrance date is not the same throughout the state. We, so it would be hard to write a contract saying we will serve kids between these ages without having even that level of similarity around the state. The other piece in terms of um, it thinking about enrollment and attendance forms, we don't have consistent enrollment and attendance forms K through 12. We don't even have the same school databases. And thinking about right now how our districts all share a similar, we all, we all use a shared power school. We've been able to manage much of this regionally. I'm not sure, you know, I'm in this conversation with Chittenden County about some of these pieces and, um, uh, and even thinking about, you know, Burlington does all of their enrollment pieces online. That is not something that in Addison County we have moved to. Um, and so that level of enrollment would be complicated to make entirely uniform. Um, I'd love to see something in the bill about the Vermont Early Learning Standards, that that's the backbone of what we understand about what children should know and be able to do at various level stages, and our curriculum and assessment tools should be uh, connected to that at a, at a deep level in both public and private partner uh, mm -hmm. programs. Yeah. Um, is there in those Vermont early learning centers, you know, we're also talking a lot about literacy. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, um, are there standards in terms of literacy and assessment at the pre-K level? So the standards, the Vermont early learning standards, there are. Um, they cover um, birth through third grade and um, they cover, I want to say it's eight different domains, social emotional approaches to learning, uh, language li and literacy, which are broken up separately, um, mathematics, history, or mathematics, social studies, physical health and development, and science, it's nine. Um, and they are um, tied to the Common Core as well. And so when you get to the K through third, kindergarten through third grade, all of those um, Vermont Early Learning Standards actually link back directly to those Common Core. But with the addition of social, emotional, physical health and development, right, some of those pieces that Common Core doesn't touch. And are there assessments in the pre-K? So the assessment tool that we use in pre-K is actually TS Gold, Teaching Strategies Gold. And it is tied to um, the Vermont Early Learning Standards. There's a crosswalk of the two. Um, they are not identical. Mm -hmm. um, TS Gold is a formative, observation-based assessment tool. Um, uh, that does have, you know, really reliability, um, uh, integrator reliability yeah. testing, and, and so forth. So it is a, you know, you can use a portfolio and observations um, and document other documentation to demonstrate kids meeting those those goals and struggling readers possibly, you know, because they're mm -hmm. so young and probably, but they would be at least. You know, looked at. You know, they you know be noted on those assessments. That's right. So we, when we, um, right now, districts can look at those um, PS Gold. Um, and in fact, I um, recently ran those reports for all of our pre-K programs, um, and I can look across those and note when there are kids who are not meeting those expectations, and um, address that with um, the program. Occasionally. Um, there are times where those um, results lead me to have a conversation about making a referral for early intervention services, that kind of thing. Um, Great. Thank yeah. you. So, and that is actually kind of leads in, right now I have access to look at all of those uh, child assessment, child progress information, and I wonder, um, and this may just be a logistical question, but if there is a bifurcation of the system, 
how districts will be able to access that child progress data in the future, because that has been incredibly valuable and I think does play into conversations around early intervention. Um, and then the last two questions I have, um, one has to do with the grievance process. Um, I'm wondering, there's, there's two paths that you can take, um, and I can see that if there was a private program that had a grievance with a district, that that district might similarly have a grievance with the private program. And right now, uh, there's, there's the two different agencies that would become involved, and I'm wondering how uh, that grievance process might be worked out between those, those two different agencies. Um, and then the last piece has to do with ongoing alignment of systems um, in a bifurcated system. So if we are setting up two different systems for public and private early childhood programs, we're really relying on ongoing alignment and agreement between those two agencies. Um, and I think that it has the potential to bifurcate the system in inequitable ways for those families, children, and programs. Um, so if this is the way we move forward, it's going to be incumbent upon the agencies to demonstrate how they are going to work together to coordinate those alignment, uh, coordinate and align those systems. Um, and to be perfectly honest, how that would be different from what's happened over the past couple of years. Thank you, Meg. You're welcome. Um, have a few questions? Um, your final point, could you elaborate just a little bit on um, maybe give some examples of inequities that you could see evolving? And then uh, totally unrelated, I needed a little bit better understanding of the problems with special ed portability, which was many bullet points up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so in terms of uh, the, the alignment of systems, I think we in the field have had less guidance around most um, topics than we would really like. Um, certainly there have been times that I've contacted um, the Agency of Education, um, the Act 166 coordinator, um, or others, and asked for specific guidance on how to handle um, a, a residency situation, for example, with a child who is maybe homeless and being served under McKinney-Vento. And there's been a general um, uh, sort of either inability to answer some of those questions or um, an inability to get together with the, the other agency to, to get a timely answer. Um, so I think, I think that it, because there's so many parties involved at a state level, it can be challenging to get those answers in a timely way um, or even at all. The other thing that has happened a lot to districts is um, in situations where there are concerns about private programs, and we've contacted either the Agency of Education or the Agency of Human Services, what we have most frequently been told is to go back and look at our, our individual district contracts and, and, and address it locally, which, which has led to lots of different um, methods around the state of dealing with those kinds of issues. I, I'm lucky at this point that I've got, we've got a solid network of Act 166 coordinators around the state, and so we're usually at this point calling one another and saying, have you ever seen this before and what did you do? Um, so at a local level, we're handling those, but it has led to inconsistency across the state. Um, and in terms of the special education portability, I would say we are meeting. Uh, I don't oversee the, the special education piece, so I would defer that to our directors of special education. But I would say um, we are meeting the needs of the families, but we have a finite pool of, of resources to be able to do that. And serving children out of district is not currently a possibility. It's, it's not allowed? This is the part I don't, I think there's a little nugget here I don't understand. So financially, our, our, we are not able to to send 
our staff out of the district um, to it just the logistics involved of getting outreach staff to Burlington say are are not that feasible. That will allow you to, to if you don't use the resources within the district, it's called giving up your free and appropriate public education, your FAPE. Mm -hmm. So, and districts can decide how far they will go. Um, so if your child is, yes. needs those services, but you live in Ripton and work in Burlington. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay. You would you would need to return to the district to receive those. So you wouldn't necessarily have to give them up. Right, but you would have to find a, a place in district. Find a place in district or bring your child back to the district for, for those, those services. services. So our, we do have outreach um, special educators who go to children's homes, who um, go into programs. Um, Within our within our districts to serve those kids, and there are children who come to the school buildings as well. Okay, so it could be a, a kind of logistical inequity <coughs> if there's a parent who leaves every morning at seven to drop their kid off at a place in Burlington where they work. And, okay, right. I, thank you. I, I, I've been having a hard time with that. Yeah, it's a little bit easier when you're looking at K twelve. It's right. just it's just much more complicated when you're looking for something that's just a ten hour program and it's a three year old. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as we look at this, one thing I'm sort of hesitant to get in the way of is um, the way things have been developing organically. Mm -hmm. um, I think that districts came together, created positions like yours. You're now talking with other people who have similar positions to yours. Yeah. We haven't been involved in that. <laughs> and it seems to be um, evolving in a wonderful way that uh, I think that in a, in a way, you know, the success of the areas that are doing pre-K correctly are because we have regional coordinators. And then now you're talking about Chicken County and all that. Um, so I guess it, it, I, I'd be more interested in ways to incentivize that organic improvement as opposed to using the heavy hand of government to do it. Any, yeah. any thoughts on that? Um, how we can better incentivize that? Well, I guess what I would say is that um, it is working pretty well in Addison County. I mean, at limits notwithstanding um, that we have made it work that I think a part of that is that the districts have come together uh, to really coordinate the other piece to that is that we have always in Addison County or for a very long time have had a very strong early childhood community with resources um, we have um, we were the first place in the um, state to have a parent child center and we have the Mary Johnson program which is um, fairly large and has been around for 50 plus years at this point and um, so there was a long history of high quality early education so that's a piece of it I think that um, but I do think that the regional coordination has been key in terms of helping families and programs navigate and districts for that matter navigate a law that has been fairly complicated I think we'd be interested at some point in, in talking with regional coordinators to find out how they set up that, how they set that up, and how we might be able to find a way to, to mm -hmm. help other districts um, with a similar kind of Ours was set up in a conversation between Building Bright Futures uh, and the, um, the districts themselves. I, it was before I was hired. So shortly after this law was passed, um, and as they were thinking about how are we going to enact it. Um, so I had a question about the license, uh, lack of, well, the lack of early educators. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, currently you're working with 32 programs, yep. you said, and that would include programs that are in districts, that are at centers, and that are in homes. That's right. And so each of those different um, environments has kind of a different uh, requirement for the for the teachers and yes. for the hours of direct instruction. So um, I guess the question that I've been kind of trying to probe a little bit is if if those 32 programs, if that capacity mm -hmm. were to migrate into, let's just say, a purely public delivery system, mm -hmm. what would that do to the number of educators? Would that actually make it 
for just as an example, would that make it harder because you've got more direct instruction, need more educators, or would there also be a countering effect that those people, like budgets aside, that those people would be compensated more in line with the rest of K-12 public teachers? I'm just kind of wondering, is this kind of a zero-sum game? Is there something we can do that would uh, be dynamic that would kind of help to and I guess on the other question, what if more of these programs came into uh, the smallest programs mm -hmm. where you had the least direct instruction required? Does that somehow help to alleviate the shortage? I'm just kind of wondering where the sliders are in that kind of... Yeah. So in Addison County, um, a few years ago, we created um, uh, a mentor teacher position. Um, Mary Johnson, um, it was an initiative that, that we developed where Mary Johnson hired a teacher um, and sent that person out into some of the local programs that didn't have licensed teachers. Um, so we had at that point uh, three home-based programs and uh, one center-based program that that mentor teacher was was supporting and that, that um, those programs were contracting to pay for. Um, and that person I, um, received what I would say was, was an, you know, a, a reasonable wage for that, but it was complicated to administer that piece. Um, since then, we, now, we still have a mentor teacher who visits two of those home-based programs. One of the home-based programs closed. And the, um, the last one was able, they had a teacher who was in process with licensure, and she finished her licensure and is now their licensed teacher. So um, I think the, the real complicating factor with early education is that for so long, there wasn't really a point to having an early childhood teaching license because there was no pay benefit. And so now the, the field is playing catch up in a lot of ways. Um, there still isn't equity in wages in the private field, in the, in the private sector, in the public sector, um, or in benefits. And so I think we would need time to be able to get there. I'm not, the other piece that I'm not sure about is 10 hours a week is a really hard, that's a hard position to fill, right? You're not gonna necessarily hire a teacher for just those 10 hours, but the realities of childcare being what they are in the private sector, you're not, you're not gonna be able to afford the, the wages full time for a teacher based on those other 30 to 40 hours of private tuition. I want to, um, I'm just looking at the time, and I want to make sure that we get Janice Stockman in, and then it might be that we would be directing questions to both of you, so. Um, Janice, thank you, and, um. Do I just go it, back here? Yes. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Um, let's see. The record is your name. Uh, I'm Janice Stockman, and I'm the Early Childhood Coordinator for the Wyndham Southeast Supervisory Union and the Wyndham Southeast School District. Um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, so my uh, job title and my job is a little bit different than Meg's. Um, as the Early Childhood Coordinator, I oversee Early Childhood Special Education and um, public pre-K, um, our partnerships, and I also serve as um, uh, a resource to our public pre-K classrooms in our um, school district for coaching, um, for resource support, and to navigate the morass of legislation and regulations and policies and programs that govern early childhood in our state. Um, Wyndham Southeast is a small district um, compared to what Meg represents. We're um, Brattleboro, Guilford, Vernon, uh, Dummerston, and Putney. Although Vernon is not technically in our school district, it's part of our supervisory union. Um, I'm in my 11th year there. 
Um, prior to that, I was a consultant to the Child Development Division and the Head Start State Collaboration Office. And during that time is when many of the discussions around public pre-K were happening. And um, Act 62 was the former legislation that allowed and made um, kind of pathways for education dollars to flow out to community private programs. Um, at that time, I wasn't a policymaker, but I was at a lot of meetings. And um, there were many discussions about how to distinguish between the kinds of programs that would qualify for this high quality pre-K education and how to distinguish those from um, the ones that met the minimum quality standards that were put forth by our Child Development Division's um, program regulations. Um, one of the things that uh, really stood out to me and was really impressive to me was that we were going to allow um, kids all around the state to receive a higher level, higher standards, and higher expectations for their education program than what were formerly um, available to them. Because we were publicly funding it, we were making some um, requirements for quality standards, and uh, you know that kids and families would have more access to high quality education. So um, the criteria that you see in um, Act 166 is a result of um, compromises made during those discussions. So um, we have a licensed teacher endorsed in early childhood ed or early childhood special education who may not actually be the classroom teacher. They may be a teacher in a classroom down the hall. They may be the director who doesn't have teaching responsibilities. They had to have stars levels, three or four or five stars, a curriculum that uh, follows the Vermont early learning standards, and using ongoing progress monitoring tools um, with this, using the state approved assessment teaching strategies goal. Um, while I support a lot of the changes that your um, draft legislation is talking about, I hope you don't change one thing. That universal pre-K or UPK is, represents a higher standard than what's available if there were no um, pre-K legislation. So I'm going to tell you what I think is working well in Wyndham Southeast, what changes um, I would like to see that could improve pre-K, um, and then I want to give you some of my responses and reactions to the draft bill. Um, so, we, so what's working well? We have 312 preschoolers um, enrolled in uh, pre-K in, in our district. Um, we've seen an increase every year that we've been doing this. So 312 is the most that we've had. We have four public classrooms um, serving children who are four years old by September 1st. Um, all of these classrooms offer a full day, so excess, in excess of the 10, hour, 10 required hours, they're there for the same amount of time as um, K through 6. Yes, just four year olds. Just four year olds, right. We have 18 partnerships um, with private early childhood programs, 17 centers, and including Head Start, and um, one family child care home. We've not limited our pre-K region, um, and our neighboring SUs have not either. Um, um, another real positive thing is that families have choices, just like um, Meg described, families can choose programs with a specific educational philosophy, um, 
they can choose programs that are located near where they work or where they live. They can choose public school, um, a private independent program. They can choose a part day, a full day, a school year, a full year. Um, and that has really worked for families, and I, I think people appreciate that. I would say for the most part, uh, Pre-K has increased the quality of early education in the community because of those standards that they have to meet. We have more licensed teachers now than before we started. Um, however, not all of those licensed teachers are actually teaching in the classroom. Some of them are the administrators of the program, um, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, the tuition reduction for families is significant, and it allows more, it's the thing that allows more children access to pre-K. Um, some children are even able to access a 10-hour limited, um, 10 hours a week program at no cost to their families. Um, even though most families need more than 10 hours, and I will talk about that later too, um, some are able to access just the 10 hours, um, but not every private provider offers that limited program. Um, another benefit is that we've created a professional community of early childhood educators um, across the public and private settings. We developed bridges between both sectors that have um, mutual benefit. Our schools know more about the kids that are coming into kindergarten, and private programs feel elevated because of their partnership with the school district, which offers them professional development, um, access to the local standards board for um, teacher license renewal, um, and a voice at the table at our school board meetings. That was something that um, was initiated last year. So um, actually, prior to our merger, <laughs> the um, private providers were coming to school board meetings to give a report, a monthly report. Um, we believe across the board, uh, across both sectors, that children and families need both strong early childhood programs in their community and strong public schools. And so um, pre-K has been a way for us to um, work together on that. So I, um, there are some changes that I would like to see um, happen. Much of which you have um, addressed in your draft. Um, I think my the first one is I really like the idea of separating out um, the administrative oversight of I'm not separating out. I would like to see administrative oversight um, go with the agency of education. Having the two separate state agencies with regulatory oversight of pre-K programs is confusing and it's inefficient. Um, I, I understand that there are capacity um, issues at the Agency of Education, and so I hope that with more responsibility for um, AOE to oversee um, all of pre-K by itself, it, those capacity issues will be addressed. Um, because my role does involve our public pre-K um, classrooms, I am um, extremely aware of the duplication of having public schools also have to follow the Child Development Division program regulations in addition to our local and state board policies. Um, I would recommend that for the public programs, we just start with a clean slate and then add in regulations that are critical to maintain health, safety, and early childhood program quality for the benefit of kids and families. Um, I think the current regulations from the Child Development Division are a good place to start for health and safety. 
standards, but the majority of the regulations are duplicative, they're unnecessary, um, or inefficient for school systems. And it's burdensome and onerous for public providers to comply with the current regulations and leads to duplication of effort, um, professional development, um, is one thing. The staff and student files where they're kept, fingerprinting and background checks, the, these are all things that um, have created a lot of um, <coughs> hair pulling and, uh, um, and extra work. Um, sometimes the regulations are even in contradiction to um, negotiated contracts for teachers and paraeducators. So I would say release the public providers from having to comply with those regulations. Um, the most significant factor in effective early education is the teacher. And teachers with professional credentials and specific knowledge and, um, and skills about teaching young children are more effective than those without those equivalent credentials. Um, I believe that every child that receives public funding for pre-K should be taught by a licensed teacher. Um, I don't have data to show you, but I go into lots of classrooms and I see the difference between um, uh, classrooms that are managed and, and taught and, um, by someone who's with a teaching background. That's not to say that there aren't excellent early childhood educators who aren't licensed teachers, but finding a way to acknowledge and recognize their skills um, and um, bring them to a level of um, having teacher certification is something I think that has been a strength of our system in the past and I would hope to see that continue. Um, also, I urge you to consider allowing teachers with preschool Montessori certification to meet the teacher licensure requirements for universal pre-K. I don't think we ever talk about that. But, um, and I don't have any particular um, investment in Montessori, except that I know in my community um, that is a program that has struggled to maintain its ability to partner with us because their teachers go through a very highly structured and um, uh, very thorough training program. Um, it just is different than our uh, state licensing um, process, and um, I think those are highly qualified teachers. And they do, they do get a Montessori certificate. They get a Montessori certificate. They have to go through, um, you know, a lot of education and specific training in order to get that. Um, we need clear guidelines and a process for um, monitoring. And I understand that this is something the AOE has been working on for a number of years. Um, we are looking forward to it um, being unveiled. And um, I, I hope that your, this committee will be hearing from um, them pretty soon about that. I, I also think that within our school districts and within our partnerships that the monitoring should be done by an outside body. I think it's hard for us to be good partners and monitor them as well. So I would just ask you to think about um, who, what is the most appropriate body to provide that monitoring. Um, I too feel like 10 hours a week of uh, pre-K education isn't enough and I, I don't have the evidence or the research to cite saying how much is the right dose or what's too little but I just anecdotally and given people's families um, situations 
10 hours is not enough. We don't, you know, maybe when I was in kindergarten, that went, maybe we had 10 hours of kindergarten, but I think we even had more then. We had a nap, too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not enough time to develop the social emotional skills and all of those early academic skills that we want kids to have by the time they're in kindergarten. Um, and finally, the private partners that I speak to want me to mention that there are administrative costs that they must bear in order to maintain the requirements that we want them to maintain in providing high quality pre-K. Um, everything from filling out forms to uh, doing the, um, the ongoing progress monitoring to a high level of <coughs> quality and reliability. Um, they would like to be able to retain some of the tuition to defray those costs. And I don't know how that would happen, but I support a way for us to talk about how some of that money could be allocated to overhead costs of partnering. I do want to say something about five-year-olds, and I didn't even, um, I didn't write that. Um, we were talking, you were talking about that a little bit before. I personally support the idea of five-year-olds being in kindergarten, and I wouldn't want to see our school districts saying this child or this child should be retained in preschool. Um, I think our schools should find ways to accommodate learners who st are struggling, and I think our schools are doing that very well. I also think that with the partnerships, our, um, with vibrant partnerships, we should be able to um, accommodate kids' needs in whatever setting or whatever at the appropriate grade level. And there is a complication when it comes to special education. So if we are saying a five-year-old isn't ready for kindergarten and they should repeat preschool, maybe there are some developmental delays that have yet to be identified. And if we keep five-year-olds in preschool and then discover that they need special education, and they turn six at some point during that year, then our early childhood special ed system isn't, are, isn't uh, licensed to serve them beyond the age of six. So I think it's very complicated um, when we're talking about that. So my reactions to the draft bill, I love, thank you so much for taking out the word pre-qualified. It's confusing, people don't know, are they pre-qualified then they are gonna get qualified? Or, so thank you for taking that away. I'm, um, I'm a little confused about the organizing structure and maybe you can help me understand it. So I, I read that AOE is responsible to administer pre-K, but the public programs go under AOE for monitoring and the private programs go under the Child Development Division or AHS for monitoring? All, all of the oversight as it currently stands in this, in draft, whatever draft it is that we have. Mm -hmm. um, the guidelines for running your pre-K program and the public program are under the agency of education, uh -huh. and if you're in, if it's a private program, it's under AHS, mm -hmm. and then we're looking at what can we make sure gets drawn back and forth between those mm -hmm. those two, and it's complicated, and this is where the draft is right now. Okay, it, this is not a done deal. Did I explain that correctly? Would you say? Okay, I'm looking at our council over here. <laughs> I think that. Uh, I think that could work as long as there's a strong um, umbrella over it that is AOE's responsibility. Because I, you know, I don't really think like a legal counsel or anything, but those are education fund dollars, right? That come out of education, and 
That definitely remains a question okay. the committee will be looking at. Because at the moment it's bifurcated completely. Yeah. There's there's a conversation that, that will emerge. Okay. We'll, we'll look at that as well. Great. I want to make sure that we have a little time. I'm also here. We've got some other folks. Um, we have some people. Um, Tiffany and Andrew, are they in no, no, no. Okay. <clears throat> so, so I think we can we can keep going. Um, I think I just want to. I just have a couple of questions that we are going to be thinking about. One is, um, the current legislation says that it has to be a licensed teacher, not the licensed teacher that's you know in the building, the licensed teacher that's teaching the class, teaching teaching for those hours. Um, we also hear that. We are understaffed at the moment. We, we don't have enough early childhood educators or special educators. How long do you think it would take? I mean, how many programs for you, for you right now would you say, I'm asking you three questions all at once, but I, I, I guess what I'm just trying to get to is, how is your area doing in terms of having licensed teachers already teaching in the private programs? Versus they're you know in the in the building coming, they're coming and maybe they're supervising maybe they're teaching for part of the time yeah um, I uh, I would say that probably um, a th I, would, I think about seven or eight of our partner programs do not have licensed teachers in the classroom. Um, for the most part, they have licensed teachers as the director or the administrator. Or they might have a teacher in one classroom but not in the other. So there would be a, a ramp up period. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, um, you know, I think there were more vibrant initiatives to increase the um, availability of supported peer review um, with a provisional license. And actually in my district, our superintendent does um, sign off on provisional license occasionally for yeah, private. I'm willing to do that. I know, and, and um, it takes a bit of convincing and um, the candidate has to prove their commitment to following through on it. But I feel like um, this may be beyond the bounds, the scope of your committee, but we are never going to get to the place where we want with uh, results for young kids if we continue to have um, inequality in qualifications and compensation for early childhood educators. So the, we're, we just need to figure that out. And it's hard, it's why we haven't figured it out so far, but um, those struggling private programs um, are not gonna make huge gains that we wanna see unless they can pay their teachers, unless they can like, find a teacher who's willing to work there and then pay them at an equivalent rate to somebody who's working in the public sector. Yeah. Just a technical question. Uh, if we take UPK vouchers aside, um, does a four, and I'll, this is goes to both of you, does a four star or NACI certified um, private provider have to have a licensed teacher in the classroom? No. No, okay. Uh, Not so, now. <laughs> right, but they do in order to uh, receive the, right. um, the voucher. Uh, and this is sort of contrary to what you actually said. I'm really glad you said it because it made me think more about it. But um, whenever we've gone to visit a private four-star NACI certified uh, center, I always ask, okay, you know, could I ever tell the difference between when pre-K is going on and when childcare is going on? And the answer is universally no. You were always watching high quality child care, which then makes me wonder about the necessity of having a licensed teacher. I mean, if you are already reaching four stars or NACI certification, are we are we saying are we adding a an unnecessary level 
by saying, and you have to have a 10 hour a week licensed teacher on premises? I don't think it's an unnecessary level. Um, I think there, the STARS and NACI accreditation um, value structural um, elements and um, reward them with, high, with that level of accreditation. And the structural elements like classroom size, um, materials, and those are really important too. The environment is really important. But I think, you know, all of the research that I read is the teacher and the skills of the teacher are the critical factors in um, high quality education, whether it's pre-K or fourth grade. Um, you can have a beautiful classroom with all the right materials and you can wash your hands at all the right times, but if the teacher doesn't know how to teach and manage a classroom, so that, that sort of I don't know what do you, well I guess what I would say Peter is um, sorry I can't see you um, I would say all of the research around what makes an effective professional development has to do with coaching and having a having a teacher with background and professional experience in education as that mentor in the room has a far greater impact than anything else so in the situations where we only have a licensed teacher on site who's not in the room, I think that doesn't happen. But in the situations where the licensed teacher might be there and be absent for a day, things can carry on because she's going with she, it's usually she, um, because she's been there most of the time. Does that make sense? Thank you. You get to start? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, great. So, um, yes, so I'm Tiffany Hubbard, and I oversee uh, the school-based programs that are provided through Washington County Mental Health to our uh, local community schools, our educational partners um, in the Washington County area. And I'm Andrew Ripley, and I provide uh, clinical oversight and supervision to approximately a third of our programs. We have a couple other clinical supervisors as well. Yeah. And as I look around the room, there are also other educational mental health leaders in the room. Amy Irish from NCSS uh, is also in. And there are some DMH folks who are very privy to the mental health services that are provided um, in our public school system. So Andrew and I are really just gonna speak about the services that Washington County provides to um, our local youth and our education system. Um, and, uh, I think each of you have, maybe you do or maybe you don't, we'll sort of move it along uh, in this PowerPoint. But just as we go through, there are some slides that we'll review and then some that we'll just um, skim over. But please don't hesitate to ask us questions along the way. It'll be very helpful. Uh, if there's information that we're providing or acronyms that we're using that you'd like more information about. What I would say is that um, the mental health services uh, locally in our, I think in our state, across our state certainly, have changed tremendously um, in the years that, uh, that I've been involved. So in 1995, Washington County created the very first behavioral interventionist position in the state of Vermont. That position is now duplicated across all designated agencies in the state and serve hundreds of youth. We run a uh, BI conference every year, and we have about an average of 600 attendees uh, of people who are providing mental health services to students in public schools. Is that Ed Spargalati doing? Oh, yeah, so Ed was one of the pioneers, yeah, of the services. In our time, over the time, those services have changed so greatly from one-on-one -on -one contracts serving one youth with a behavioral interventionist uh, a behavior consultant and a case manager wrapping up that youth um, to building a system that really looks at and is supporting a multi-tiered system of support within schools. The needs of the youth have changed drastically over the years. We'll talk about that. Um, our, our ability to employ quality mental health professionals in schools to address the acuity of need and the numbers of students who are in need of those services and support have also changed dramatically. 
Um, so there are a number of challenges that we face, but there is some fantastic work that's being done statewide in different ways, um, addressing the mental health uh, services that we can provide to the local youth. As we look, just moving through some of these pieces, um, let me come back. Some of the trends that we've seen over time, I think this is a good place to start. Um, uh, of the students that uh, are in schools, that teachers uh, who are trained as educators to train on academics and academic subject area are now faced with a student population uh, with a demographic that is entrenched in trauma. We're talking community trauma, family systems trauma, um, and that trauma is manifesting itself every day in school in the form of aggression, isolation, self-injury, mental illness uh, for young children all the way up through elementary, middle, and high school. At this time, we serve a greater number of youth um, in the programs that we oversee, and we'll talk in a moment specifically about those numbers, um, pre-K through fourth grade. The population um, in K-1-2 is, uh, is our highest population of the students that we serve. Some of the things that we see uh, on a regular basis for the students that we serve is uh, substance abuse and abuse as one of the uh, as a family factor. It's almost a contributing or almost a universal contributing factor for children that are uh, in the services that we're providing within the schools. There's an increase in mental health need in the caregiving system, poverty and economic stress. There's an abundance of DCF involvement. Um, many of the youth that we serve have been either in residential placements and or on track to either be hospitalized and or placed in residential care based on their level of need. When we look at some of the lists of the trends that we're seeing, this wasn't um, the presentation of the youth that were referred a number of years ago. They were more developmentally delayed. Uh, they were children who had significant learning impairments, who their behavior uh, presented in such a way that um, created some difficulty in their ability to learn. So 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, we would get contracts to help support students in school around managing their behavior so that education staff could then teach them the necessary skills. Now. Uh, we are working with children who uh, come to school with far more in their backpack every day than the books uh, and the pencils um, and the paper that is going to and from school. Um, Lisa, you want to say about that, Andrew? Yeah. Uh, so just a, a little bit of my perspective. Um, I started this work about 12 years ago. Uh, I had not long before that, completed my undergraduate degree at UVM and taught at an international school. Uh, and I, I really started to miss Vermont and my family and the connections and the cold weather even, uh, the changing lights of the day, the, the whole nine. And, and so I moved back uh, and I was looking around for teaching positions and this was about 2008. Uh, and it was really difficult to find a teaching position at that time. Teachers weren't retiring, they're like, we need to kind of hold on. Uh, so I continued to look around, look in the area where I'm connected, I'm from this area, and landed in what was then called TAPAS. Uh, so that was the one-on-one -on -one BI program that Tiffany's talking about. Uh, I, I worked in one of these schools that was entrenched with this trauma. The, the young kiddo that I was supporting uh, witnessed a domestic violence, substance abuse, parental incarceration, uh, a lot of risk factors kind of stacked up against him. Today, kind of fast forward a little bit to, you know, to now, and I'm overseeing a lot of the clinical work that's happening within these programs, and the, like Tiffany's saying, the, the level of acuity has just continued to rise and increase, uh, it, which, it, which is really changing how we're working with these students and, and the teachers and, and schools that are supporting them. Um, the, the kid that I worked with so many years ago, one-on-one, -on -one, would now almost, I, I can say with a pretty high degree of certainty, would not have been given a referral for one-on-one -on -one services. They would have been referred to one of our less intense programs that serve kids with ratios of closer to 10 to 1. Uh, so mental health professionals embedded kind of in the schools 
working under our clinical oversight and supervision to train and support teachers in helping these students. And so th that, that kind of is the, the position that I'm coming from with all of this. Um, it's, it's a really, we're doing a lot of things really right. Uh, and, and I think we still have a long way that we can go to continue to kind of build and support these communities to get through and past all of the, the adverse events that are occurring in these kids' lives. Um, the list just delineates just a few of those. When we speak about the services that we've provided in time from uh, the position that Andrew is referring to, we currently in Washington County alone have 40 clinical staff that uh, oversee 350 youth receiving mental health school-based services. Um, 49 of those staff, or 49 staff in addition to the clinical staff, uh, provide one-on-one -on -one services to youth. And um, those 49 youth, I mean those 49 staff are serving um, some of our most or the most intensive need youth in the community. As a result, we have a high number of working comp claims because of the aggression, the violence, the risk of harm that's taking place on a regular basis. The behavior that we once were addressing in school, uh, which was oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, distraction, um, has shifted gears so significantly. Um, violence, physical intervention to keep the student safe, our staff safe, uh, education team safe, um, the uh, involvement with law enforcement that's in school um, around some of the level of need that's incredibly disruptive in classrooms in the school community are just some, to name a few, um, of the changes that we've seen manifest over time. When we think about uh, programs that we have, as I think I created a slide here when I just looked at sort of the services that Washington County alone has put together in an effort to support our local school system and the ever-growing need of the students. Uh, behind me, listen, behind me is a number of the programs and the dates and the years in which they started in an effort, in an effort to meet the overwhelming demand uh, that schools were um, contracting with us for, reaching out on a regular basis for referrals. That has not stopped with about approximately 100 clinicians working in our local schools. We have referrals of about 15 to 20 referrals for services uh, for students that we are unable to address at this time. A number of those students are not even in school. They're receiving two hours of tutorial instruction outside of the school building each day because their level of need has been determined to be so unsafe that they're not able to be managed in the school. These students are receiving tutorial services in local police stations, in local libraries, uh, wherever the school or the educational teams um, and administration can find space that's available to offer that tutorial service, all while waiting for mental health to be able to pick up the referral. Some of the challenges for us to be able to pick up those referrals is staffing. We currently have about 40 staff vacancies in school-based services alone alone, and yet we still serve over 350 students locally in our community. There are, at this time, two active PBIS uh, clinician referrals. That particular program here, the Positive Behavioral Intervention and Support Clinician Program created in 2019, um, was created under the, the uh, idea of doing more with less providing more mental health services uh, with fewer number of professionals to serve as many kids as we possibly could within a school system. In 2013, we started with one clinician. We now have 13 clinicians with two to three referrals waiting for us to hire those clinician positions. That is proven to be incredibly difficult for us because they require a master's degree and specialized training and support and applied behavioral analysis to be able to work with and provide the mental health needs that these students require. And our ability to pay those positions uh, in a way that's able to maintain them and sustain them is so incredibly limited. As a result, a number of the qualified staff are hired by the public school system 
uh, because they can make more money <coughs> to work through the school system, and yet um, the need of the students are so intense that the school system needs the designated agency to provide the designated agency services. And yet, we're having a very difficult time hiring uh, and maintaining the qualified staff to provide that set of service. So that is an ongoing challenge that we face on a regular basis uh, because the acuity of need for the students that are being referred uh, require the psychiatric oversight. They require the mental health services support through counseling. They require uh, the respite services that the designated agency has that's able to be provided. For us, uh, within the school system, we provide a lot of the behavioral support, run a lot of mental health groups, uh, and can push counseling services in. But it's not meeting the need of the students that are there in terms of numbers, in terms of numbers. So we battle every year vacancies. Uh, we battle um, the ability to be able to pick up all of the referrals uh, that come our way for students who are not in school at this time, waiting uh, to be educated based on our ability to provide staffing um, to some of you. So just a, a little bit about that uh, positive behavior support clinician position that I think is so powerful and, and I think it's really important that we continue to pursue and, and kind of develop that program. The, the professionals who fill those roles are collaborating with their local school teams to kind of build and support the systems that are designed to meet the needs of every student in the school, right? So they're kind of informing that universal level of social emotional learning uh, within these different schools. And then they're working in a more targeted capacity with the students whose needs aren't met with that universal level of instruction. So we're helping bring schools into using best practice uh, and kind of helping shape and mold that along the way and then providing those kind of targeted services that bring in the psychiatric support, the, the additional case management that comes with these positions. And the needs of those students over time, so I wasn't the first one, but I was the second, right around the same time. Uh, the needs of the students when I first started were very different than the needs of the students whom I'm overseeing now. Uh, in 2013, 2014, the, the internal systems within school communities weren't robust enough to kind of support all of their students. And so that's why we had all of these referrals coming in. And I think as we help develop those systems, we're able to, schools are able to meet more of the need, but it's still not enough. Uh, and so the referrals that my clinicians get are for pretty aggressive and intense behaviors. Uh, really major mental health diagnoses, uh, developmental diagnoses, and, and, and those children bring with them this, this huge set of complex challenges with trauma, with their, with their disability, uh, and then even within the, the schools that are supporting them, trying to understand how do we make this person a part of our community? How do we keep them a part of our community? Uh, it, it, within, within our programs, we have a, a, a saying called, within multi-tiered systems of support, there's universal, secondary, and tertiary levels. Uh, and we have what we call 2.9ers, right? So the, those are the kids at the very top of that secondary level that 10 years ago, those were tier three students. And they were served in an individual capacity with a one-on-one -on -one interventionist and a case manager and a behavior consultant. And now we're asking our school-based clinicians to work with these kids with less resources that both at the schools have and when we're able to find the folks to fill these positions, uh, they're just kind of overrun sometimes with a, a feeling of urgency and need to help to help all these kids because I think that's really why everyone gets into it is to help the kids. So one of the um, what used to be one of the uh, unique um, sort of makeups or infrastructures for how we provided services in Washington County that has now been duplicated also across the state is that we provide a significant level of wraparound mental health services to the youth. So the wraparound being a case manager or a clinician, as well as a behaviorist and uh, an individual who provides that one-on-one -on -one capacity. Much of the case management uh, work or the school clinician work is spent in the homes, in these children's homes, working with their families, um, supporting that family system. 
the family system um, varies by significant degree for so many of the students. We have, uh, last year we had, we served one of the highest levels of homeless population that we had served in my 20 some odd years of doing this work. We had youth every day that we would have a staff that would meet um, the student at a parking ride where uh, that family was living, homeless, in their car. So when we picked the children up to bring them to school, for many of them, we were going to a parking lot to pick them up from their car where they were staying for that evening. We fill bags of food at the end of the day for a number of our youth so that they have food to eat when they go home. Because home is a question that we answer almost every afternoon for a sadly larger than ever should be population of students when they say, where am I going today? Do you know where I'm gonna be staying tonight? Mm -hmm. Feeding these students, picking them up in parking lots from cars that they had slept in, um, helping them get items out of their bags, their backpacks at school, and pulling out jewels, and pulling out bags of marijuana, and picking up the Bacardi, the empty Bacardi rum bottle that fell out of our preschooler's bag on Tuesday morning at school, is just some of the stuff that our staff are working with these youth on a regular basis. And yet these students come to school and there's this overwhelming expectation that they are gonna attend and they're gonna learn and they're gonna follow instruction and they're gonna walk perfectly well in a straight line and they're only gonna raise their hand and they're gonna respond when called upon. And that's just not how it is, right? That's just not how it is. Our Beckley Day program, I just wanna to jump to that really quickly. In 2010, as in an effort to not, um, uh, to reduce the need for alternative school placements for some of the youth that we were supporting in school um, who uh, were boarding at the ER, waiting for um, placements at the Broadmoor Retreat, at Barrett Center, at NFI for assessments and evaluations. We created the Beckley Day Program as part of our school-based mental health services and support. It's a crisis stabilization program that um, in an effort to keep youth in their community and to provide them um, of a, with a high quality of education and mental health services. At our children's department, um, we provide a program, a crisis oriented program that provides stimulus control, educational, social, emotional, and behavioral support in an intense way. Um, through the uh, children's division around wrapping youth up and keeping them within the community without needing to have them be hospitalized. That, capacity, that, that program has the capacity to serve 12 youth. Those 12 youth come with 12 behavior interventionists, um, a board certified behavior consultant, a program manager, a program clinician, and each of them has assigned a case manager. That program in terms of its staffing has increased dramatically over the last nine, now 10 years that it's been in place. Because the youth that were coming to that program and or who are referred to that program, the amount of home support that we provide to those youth uh, in their home to stabilize their home um, in an effort to allow them to transfer from one environment to the next, a school environment, a mental health environment, and a home environment, that allows them conducive to build skills, um, both academic skills as well as social and emotional skills, um, requires such significant oversight based on the behavioral presentation that we see of these youth. We have on average anywhere between six to eight referrals for that program that run every single month that we are unable to staff so when you think about the level of youth that are generally served in a hospital setting in our effort to keep them in the community that both are not able to be hospitalized at this time because of the wait list and are not able to be served through the Beckley Day program, they are pushed into their educational system and these students show up in public schools every day. When they can't, they receive that tutorial service outside of the school. The pressure for us to be able to serve those youth, because none of us want to know that there's children uh, that are not being served, um, led us to move all the way down to this 
base piece to this pod model was to create a um, service provision uh, that would allow us to serve more youth with the staff that we currently have available to us. So we took or we moved away from what once was individual service contracts for one youth when schools would need to refer to a, uh, a youth to mental health to provide mental health services. And we now bundled a contract where school systems can purchase a set of professionals, mental health professionals, that we then place into a school system that have the ability to serve up to uh, an identified amount um, of youth based on their clinical capacity and need. This was in a response to mental health's needing to do more with what service, what staff, what qualified staff they had available. We started the first year with about seven pods, eight pods. And in our second year, uh, we now have 10 pod contracts. So there are, um, in the eight supervisory unions in the 27 schools that we support, we have 10 pod contracts where school districts or our supervisory union are purchasing a set of mental health professionals to be placed in their local school districts and then mental health and education are sitting together in a clinical capacity asking educators to come on board and the administration to sit in um, a clinical capacity with us to review the students that are in need and to help identify which students, almost triaging need, are in need of the mental health services and support. That conversation, that is evolving on a regular basis for us. We're just a couple of years in and we're working out some of the kinks. Um, we're finding some challenges in that the clinical teams that we've placed in the school um, are feeling a bit overwhelmed with the need that are seeing the students uh, in the school, classroom teachers coming up to them in the hallway saying, please, what do I need to do to get a student on your team? Um, and uh, there's a student that's moving, but I have four students that need to come on in. So we are stretched regularly to try to still, even with this new effort, to place a team of up to eight mental health uh, professionals in a pod in a supervisory union still to be able to stay on top of the need. When we look at schools, um, services that we're able to provide through the designated agency as well as what the local education agencies are able to provide if they do the services on their own when they look at the children uh, that they have for services, I mean, that they have for need. We've just lined out here, just, um, and this is not um, a, um, a closed list, meaning there are far more, uh, we just hit a, a number of the bulleted ones, um, but here are some of the services that uh, the schools are able to access when they receive mental health services for their youth in school. So their efforts to be able to, or when they have to decide, uh, can we get a child into the mental health services? Is there enough staffing available? Is there enough resources available? If there's not, then here's how we serve them. This is what we have available. Um, we're constantly juggling how we provide the mental health services to the robust population of students um, that are in school that are on our wait lists regularly. Um, and the challenge for the school systems is that there's not enough service and support for all of them. So we have to be able to do what we can do for those who don't you know, make the cut for the mental health services. So uh, we're constantly looking at different ways to provide those services and how we can help meet the needs. I'm going to move back here just a little bit. Uh, in 1997, we created what was uh, what we still refer to today as a governance board. And this is unique to Washington County at this time, although um, I tout it as much as I possibly can across the state. Since 1997, all school administrators, SPED directors, building principals, and uh, myself, the children's director at Washington County, as well as the director of Choice Academy, which is our alternative school, come together once a month. And all of us sit uh, around a table at a conference center for about two and a half hours, and we talk about the needs of the students in our schools and how we can build programming and how we can provide services to meet and address those needs. That has proven to be incredibly effective and beneficial to 
so many students in our area. That is how all of the programs that you've seen listed have been created over time in collaboration with our educators around here's what we're experiencing, here's the presentation, how can we partner with you, uh, how can we get some of these needs met. Despite the services we were able to provide, despite the number of students we serve, there is always and there continues to be an ongoing conversation around we're not doing enough. We collectively, mental health education, we have two, we have far more youth that need these sets of services than what we're able to provide. What about the other students? How do we continue to provide it? Um, as we speak, as I'm here today, I'm not in our governance board, which was today um, for the for this month's meeting, where they're talking about um, building, where some of the conversation is talking about building um, alternative programming within the public schools, because our our ability uh, to serve them outside of the school um, is compromising school budgets uh, and their ability to provide educational staffing. So the governance board has proven to be incredibly beneficial for us. We talk about the challenges. We talk about the successes. Um, we talk about um, family systems that move from district to district. So there's an awareness of need uh, and services that can be provided. Board or? So I, I'm not sure exactly how it lines up with governance board, but um, one of our one of our local partners, one of the SUs that we partner with really closely, uh, has contracted for that set of professional services, right? So the, the pod, or there are BIs across their supervisory union, and in every school in that district, there is a positive behavior support clinician, and so seeing how. The programs can kind of work together to meet the needs of the entire supervisory union has been a, a really eye-opening kind of experience uh, and is an ongoing challenge uh, to find the right people to do it. It takes a pretty unique set of skills to be able to build an alternative program within a public school. How do you prevent students from needing to be outplaced? You support them earlier and better uh, to the greatest extent possible, you support the adults who are interacting with them and learning how to do that. And when I when I think about this this SU, we've recently kind of undergone some some changes in how we're structuring uh, our PBS clinicians within some of their schools to create more of a, a fluid K through 12 or pre K through 12 model uh, to allow for some of the things that Tiffany's talking about. Uh, following a family when there are multiple students who are being referred for these more intense levels of service so that there's a unified point of contact. There's not a loss of information when a student goes from an elementary school to a middle school just because they're changing buildings. They have the same team, the same set of connected professionals to continue to support them. Uh, and, and, and it's a it's, it's a pretty powerful it's a pretty powerful thing to witness when schools come together and they have a list of students that's a mile long. These are small communities and the numbers are really staggering and what's, what the schools are doing and what we're trying to help them with is how do we, how do, we do that triage? How do we look through this list and say who's, whose needs can be best met with which supports? How do we get the most help for the kids, the most right help? Because it's not all the same. So how do we get the right help for the kids and as many of them as possible. And kind of helping schools and learning how schools think about that and, and witnessing their process and taking part in it uh, has allowed me to really see the extent of the, the mental health crisis that is essentially within these communities. I'm, I'm mindful of the time, and I want to make sure that we have time for um, our committee members to ask you questions. Yeah. So I don't know if you're... Yeah, yeah. that's a good time. Yeah. You ready? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, it's um, stunning to hear your testimony on the number of children that you're trying to serve. Um, how many statewide have you connected with other mental health services? Do you have In terms of numbers, um, I guess. So I don't have those numbers exactly, um, but the, you just oh, for the record, Tracy Munging from the Department of Mental Health, but that's certainly something that we can get for you. Could you, could yep, you do absolutely. that for me, please? Yes. Um, and for the committee, thank you. And one other question, your governance board, mm -hmm. uh, again, what is the makeup of that board? 
So the makeup of that board is uh, the Director of Children and Youth Services from Washington County, um, myself, the Director of School-Based Services, and the Director of Alternative School Placement, um, and then all the SPED directors, and in some districts where the SPED director can't be represented, um, the Director of Curriculum and or uh, a building principal represents the schools or the SU of the students uh, or of contracts that they have with us. Any law enforcement? There is not law enforcement. And why would there not be? Uh, because the way the governance board, there's not a reason for them to not attend. Um, we've had broader based meetings where law enforcement has participated. Most recently this year, uh, we have the district director of DCF particip participates in our governance board. Um, but for many years, it was the collaboration between education and mental health um, and the provision of the contractual services that we were providing to the schools. Have you heard of Project Vision in Rutland? Project Vision in Rutland? Um, I'll see if I can get some information for you. It's made a significant difference nice. in our community. Hmm. Significant. And particularly yeah. with drug related issues. Yeah. And children. Great. Uh, uh, Law enforcement sits on it. Absolutely. As yeah. <clears throat> the collaborative part of it is well, the hospital, the school system, the police departments, the sheriff departments. Right. I mean, there's a, it, it's amazing how many people have come together mm -hmm. and have made a significant difference in housing and a, lot, a, a multitude of different things. Uh, I'll see if I can't grab you some. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I will look into that. Yeah. Okay. Project, Project vision. vision. You can look it up. Yep. It's, For each school in which we have a clinician, each of them sits in the school's EST team. Um, and there are law enforcement uh, officers that sit in many of those EST teams, but those are smaller, the more school uh, specific versus the broader looking at the entire county and the services through the county. But yeah, thank you for that. Act 264, 1988, <laughs> set the relationship between the designated, designated agencies and the school. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we need to follow that up and dust it off, or is it working well? <laughs> So I sit on the Act 264 committee for the state, <laughs> um, and I have for um, eight years, I believe. We talk about this regularly uh, at the Act 264 board. Um, and Tracy, if you were just going to say something, feel free to, to jump in. Each of the youth, uh, all of the youth that we serve, um, have a coordinated services plan. Uh, and they uh, and we have the reviews every six months and we use them actively and there's been a huge push and proponent of that um, really driven uh, through the Federation of Families as well as uh, the Act 264 board um, to take a lot of data to make sure that across the state um, because it's an entitlement um, that every youth has the right or our family has the right to a coordinated services plan and it's uh, and it's annual review we do use those, at least in Washington County, I can speak to our designated agency um, significantly. It's helpful to bring everybody to the table. I was on the, um, the, the child trauma uh, yeah. work group a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we were looking at was that 264. It got lost somewhere in the Senate. I think right. I don't remember what happened to it. But I do remember hearing that there were some schools that had to deal with more than one designated agency. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what they had a great relationship with one, but it didn't work as well with the other. Mm -hmm. And then there were criticism about the school, but in reality it was that complexity. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? <laughs> on, on, you know, it, I think if they said we could just have one designated agency. Yes. That we worked with, how well that would work. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I can see where that might be the case. I mean, we certainly, and we have for years, Washington County has crossed uh, county lines. So we provide, um, well, we have three pods, four pods. I'm just thinking clinicians off the top of my head, two, four, six, six clinical staff, probably about 24 BI staff, mm -hmm. um, and two clinical coordinators that oversee staff that work outside of Washington County, work in Caledonia, um, 
central supervisory union area. So that would be uh, an example of a school system who would have both Northeast Kingdom and Washington County. Um, and so if we open a case, if we're providing services and those students are identified through our designated agency, then we would run the CSP. Uh, for those who were not a part of our contractual agreement with the school, um, then they would be served through Northeast Kingdom. And, I, and so I can see where that, I mean, that there's a couple that would receive different designated agency supports. Just a quick one. Um, my favorite topic are prisons mm. and Woodside. Mm. How do we support our children in Woodside? who are supposedly the worst of the worst, and that's why they're there. Um, is it Community High School of Vermont? Do they have to do that? Or who, who encompasses these kids? I know there might not be any right now, and they might be closing out, but we still don't know what's going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. I know there are great conversations uh, in the state. There's also a significant amount of conversation that's taking place within our agency around how we support some of the, the youth that um, that are either being discharged or will be leaving Woodside. I think there those are the same student, that's what I'm trying to, I think it's important for us to say that we serve a similar population to the youth that are, um, residing at Woodside right now. There are still a number of those youth with similar uh, presentations with legal charges uh, and family systems that look quite similar to those youth that are in our community right now. Um, so how we talk about providing housing, residential care, mental health wraparound services and support, providing services to education systems uh, for these children set in education. Um, certainly those are conversations that have started to be dabbled in at our governance board. Um, and I'm sh certain that they will likely continue as, as time increases I know, just, for the... I worry about those children. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. It's one thing, it's a horrible thing in the high schools. But I also worry so much about the ones that have been removed from that setting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, that very first student that I worked with 12 years ago uh, had three younger brothers. And one of them went to Woodside. Uh, one of them is currently served in an unidentified capacity. He's in high school now. Uh, and so I, I think the best tact is prevention, right? How do we stop the kids from having to get there? And it's, it, it's with those community-based supports. It's with the intensive in-home push-in parent training, with the behavior intervention, with the school staff training. It's like, how do we make these kids feel like they're part of our community, like they're connected, like we all feel like we're part of communities, because when you're a part of something, you're less likely to be disruptive towards it. And so making those kids really be a part of the community, uh, I think, is the best way to help the kids that might end up in Woodside is to I'm stopping from getting there. Thank you. Yeah. So glad you brought up the issue of prevention. So I'm going to give you kind of a pick one or the other. Just take your time. <laughs> sure. You know, the difference here. Uh, we're talking about uh, a universal after school program yeah. funded um, with all the receipts from uh, marijuana sales if we go down that path. Uh, if you had the choice of putting all that money into high quality early education, child care, or is it after school, which do you think would be the more effective use of that money? Oh, that is a tough question. That was a low blow. That was a choice. I mean, it, it is a tough question. I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong you know, answer, and, and, and you could sit on both sides of the fence. There is such a mm -hmm. significant need for one getting children off the streets, and two, the latchkey children who are at home or in home environments after school that um, are not conducive to mental health or mental well-being. Uh, and so much of the behavior uh, and aggression and volatility that we deal with every day is what they're exposed to after school hours. So that's huge. We all know that early ed, early prevention, uh, early child care, infant toddler care, um, Providing necessary supports to that developing brain has a lifetime impact, has a lifetime impact. Um, and I've always been, for the 25 years of doing this, 
have always been a huge supporter of catching children when they're young. Because if we can build their foundation, that developmental foundation, rather than it being built on a fragmented foundation and everything we teach beyond that is being built from a fragmented for foundation where we're just trying to fill in the gaps constantly so that as they continue to, to develop, um, that that foundation, those cracks don't get wider and wider, um, is so beneficial. It is absolutely so beneficial. And early children's mental health is so important. So yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would pick one or the other. <laughs> That's tough. Yeah. Divide yeah. it in yeah. half with a little me. Right, right. Can you right. 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 I'm going to, um, so you know, let's have you be the last question, because I want to make okay. sure we have another little break. Yep, I'll make this quick. I just want to make a statement just about uh, the what you just said about the developing brain. Yeah. Um, I just read a study that trauma increases the size of the hippocampus mm -hmm. in our brain, mm -hmm. um, which is in charge of controlling emotions mm -hmm. and attention, and it never grows back down. Mm -hmm. So I really support you getting in really early with families mm -hmm. because I think once that happens, once that hippocampus increases because of trauma, it's, it's really hard for a kid mm -hmm. to master the skills they need. Mm -hmm. um, the other question I have, I, don't know how to pay, I, I was a school guidance counselor and addressing mental health when I left was one of the biggest dilemmas um, for me in terms of, but it sounds like you're developing like this pod system sounds fabulous, you know, in terms of it, where it's evolved. But I'm just wondering in terms of the other children, mm -hmm. the children that don't need your services, do you feel like the children that are um, struggling with mental illness have a big impact on other kids being able to access their learning? Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Sure. Um, I, th I think they are impacted by it, right? When 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 students are in classes together, they go to lunch together, they go to recess together. You see the trials and tribulations and successes of all of your classmates, and and regardless of what those are, those will have an impact on your fellow students. Uh, but I think the real the real target there is how do we help teach the rest of our community how to be supportive allies and advocates for their community members that have disabilities? Uh, how do we make sure that they know, OK, like this is not about me or what the teacher just said. And how do we equip those young children with the skills to talk about it with a safe adult, to identify their own emotions about it, to kind of navigate some of those challenges. Uh, I think it's oftentimes, uh, you know, we have to, we all live together, right? And so we have to learn how to coexist, and that, that's on both sides. And so whether the students are suffering from major mental illness or are neurotypical, uh, how do we support both of them to live together? Because we can't have any more people leaving. We need more people here. Uh, so if, how do we teach folks to kind of coexist, really? Um, in terms of the access to the education, uh, I, I'm not sure I can speak specifically mm -hmm. to that, yeah. uh, because it's, I think it's so variable. Um, Do you think it's safe to say there's a significant impact? It's hard not to be impacted when there's desks being flipped, chairs yeah. being thrown, and you are at risk of being injured. And that's an everyday occurrence in our public school system. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Um, and so we are mindful and cognizant all the time about the ripple effect of the behavior of one or two students in a classroom yeah. and how to create and promote safety. Because if you're going to school not feeling safe, whether it's a result of peers uh, or a result of a system, then it's really hard to learn when you're questioning your safety on a regular basis. And if I could just say one piece about the developing brain and the hippocampus. Yes, well, indeed, that is true. Um, there is such plasticity in our neurology, mm -hmm. and for that, uh, all of us should be incredibly grateful. Mm -hmm. The work that all mental health clinicians do on a regular basis for young students and adults alike are creating new neural pathways so that they can learn new ways mm -hmm. to respond, to regulate, to monitor, and modulate their behavior. 
and they can learn it with repetition and routine um, despite the life experiences that continue to be thrown at them. Mm -hmm. um, so the brain's ability to change and adapt is also as true at later years as it is in those early developmental years where trauma is uh, changing the way it is initially designed and developed. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you for your work. Thank you. 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 And I would love to put a shameless plug out here, since you're all at the table, that every year um, the Success Beyond Six uh, BI directors for the state of Vermont and all the designated agencies put on a BI conference for all these BIs that you hear us testify again about every year. Um, and the last two years I've sat as a chair for that program, and I've sent um, letters to each of you and emails inviting you to that conference. Um, and I would, I'm going to do so again in August, and I would really encourage you to come. Senator Ash came last year. Um, we've invited the governor this year, and we're seeing anywhere from 500 to 600 um, behavior interventionists that are working in this public schools and sitting on this committee. I think it's really important for you to be a part of that and see what that looks like. Yes. So I will come out. Thank you. you did. <laughs> yes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for coming in. This has been quite a topic that we've been finding ourselves waiting through, and very much appreciate um, your testimony. So for the record, could you tell us who you are? Sure. I'm Beth Cobb, superintendent at Essex Westbridge School District. And I'm Jackie Tolman. I'm the director of learning and instructional impact for Essex Westbridge. Thank you. Right. So we are going to explain um, what we are doing in Essex Westford School District to meet our literacy needs, what we've done, and our plan to move forward. Our testimony that we turned in to all of you is really the why behind we're doing it and state some research. Um, so the impact and really what has hit home for us and the impact of literacy and how important it really is. So we quoted um, and have some in there. So we began our um, looking at literacy. We are a newly formed district. This is our third year. And I am the, um, in my third year as superintendent for Essex Westford. I came from the Bradford area superintendent. Um, very excited to start with a new district and really hone in on the needs of all our students in the district. We created, um, through a lot of a large needs assessment, created our continuous improvement plan, which we actually call our um, instructional strategic plan as well. The continuous improvement plan is the AOE's name for it, but we believe it really guides and does everything that, that's, that's our plan, that's our plan forward. Um, we made some pretty bold statements in our aspirations and measurable outcomes looking at our data. So the one that we will focus on today, because you want to know about literacy, is that by the end of third grade, all students will read on grade level. So it's a bold statement to make. Um, we had pushback in the beginning for people saying, well, how are you going to do that? And shouldn't we say, and from teachers, shouldn't we say 80%? And my comment is, what do we do with the other 20? So you're leaving 20% back behind, and what if your child was in that 20%? So we really went full force. We're questioned about that by the board last night even. You know, how long do you think 100%? So that is our statement, and what it's really done for us by stating that has had us very extremely focused we have um, d really dove into our achievement gaps in literacy and have been presenting that to the board. Our achievement gap is large for those that are on an IEP and those that um, from our, our racial communities. And um, so we know we have that. It's, I feel like it's the first time that we have really dove into that and pulled that data. Um, and it's hard to see. It's courageous conversations around it. Um, but we're doing it. We are doing it, absolutely. So Jackie joined us this year um, and has done a phenomenal job on getting us focused on that measurable outcome. So 
I'll be quiet for a minute and let Jackie talk. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I think to, to what Beth was saying, one of the most critical components of uh, achievement of, of a goal, especially one such as lofty as this, that all children will read on grade level by uh, the end of grade three, is to really look at what your, your current reality is and paint an accurate picture of that current reality. And so as Beth mentioned, what we've done is we've looked at multiple sources of data. And, and on one hand, where people might have said in the past, uh, well, you know, 75% uh, of our kids at grade for our reading on grade level, and so you know we're above the state standard in, in reading on SBAC scores. So you know that's good for us. But then when you disaggregate that further, you uh, look at our gaps of upwards of 60% of our kids, dependent on demographic uh, qualifier, are not reading on grade level, and that that trend actually goes uh, third grade through our high school. And so again, a demographic should never define a destination. And so that is what we are saying in Essex Westford. We are getting away from that idea that just because you might come to us with this specific characteristic or this, you know, you, this will be your, your fate. Uh, but to do that, right, so how do we do that as, as a system? So we really are paying close attention to our data and we're pay paying very close attention to the technical skill sets that our teachers need to analyze data and not just the 30,000 foot data, you know, such as SBAC and what that gives us at the state level, but our uh, tri-annual local assessment data. And then we are further developing our data literacy uh, colleagueship to look at the ground level data. And we are developing a system in which our teachers at each grade level are going to be looking at data on a bi-weekly basis of what is actually happening for their kids in their classroom. So with the intent of closing that achievement gap through data analysis at, at, at a time when there's actually something that we can do about it versus waiting sometimes months, sometimes years for our kids to get the intervention that they need. So, right. so we is. have <laughs> created a system where we have the belief of professional learning communities and teachers learning from one another. We have experts and we, um, it's the only profession, it is a profession that's been very isolated for many years. So to open those doors and have people communicating with each other, planning together, looking at each other's work, student work, looking at each other's assessments and really learning how do we move the system forward. Um, particularly in literacy and mathematics, but again, we're focused on literacy for this. So we have um, a viable, sustainable curriculum is needed. So we have teachers currently working on literacy's um, essential standards, and every standard that the, that the teachers, we have a thousand standards. We really have to narrow those down to make sure that, I'll use grade two, at grade two, every student meets the standard in, Mm -hmm. three or four within reading. The others are great to know, but we are going to really focus in on certain standards. So that, and when those students don't get that standard, the classroom teacher will try other strategies, intervention within the first instruction, and then if that doesn't work, call on others to help with an intervention system that is woven around the data. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is powerful work because it's, it's teachers themselves who we are charging with doing this work for our kids, looking at the vast majority of standards that they previously have been accountable to. But what has been lacking is that systemic approach to truly identifying what is most essential for kids to be able to succeed at the next level, to matriculate to that next level. And so when you have the folks that are on the ground actually doing this work and really wrapping their expertise around that, and then working with interventionists and special educators and coaches to identify, again, what is most essential and then match that instructional strategy and that assessment to what is most essential, that, again, that uh, develops your guaranteed and viable curriculum, right? That, and then vertically align that and you will have power powerful systemic shifts. So this year, um, we are, both Jackie and I are in an instructional leadership course, which is um, a majority of our principals are in. And we are conducting learning how to do walkthroughs and what we're looking for in a literacy classroom. So our principals can offer feedback to teachers. So we are working together as a leadership team really defining what do we want to see in a literacy classroom. A well-balanced, including the phonemic awareness. Where does that fit into our balanced assessments um, and balanced literacy program? So we're working with our leadership team doing that. We're, um, they're practicing, we all are, are practicing good guided feedback so they can really 
um, coach teachers to move move forward and learn. Um, we're trying to, I keep saying to Jackie, what we want is a learning system where everybody's learning, including us, where we need to be learning as well. Um, I have a clarifying Yes. Question. You use the term balanced literacy. Yes. yes. Is that capital B, capital L, or small b, small L? Capital B, capital, capital, a, capital yeah. L. Yeah, and we, we speak to those individual components of a balanced literacy approach in our testimony. You'll see it referenced in a few different, different areas, yeah. <clears throat> Yes, and there's a lot, there's misconceptions out there what a balanced literacy <laughs> yes. program is. Yes. I feel like as when I went through um, my pre, in, in college to learn about reading, I, I think I had two courses and my minor was reading. So to come out, I learned about balanced literacy, but I learned more about how to teach comprehension, how to use visual, and I did not learn a lot about phonemic awareness. I only did that when I started to dabble in, what is this reading recovery stuff? And what are the sounds kids need to know? Um, so just to piggyback on what Beth just said, so I went through the system, actually the same system, but uh, eight or so, a, a little bit of a time after Beth, yeah, she is and, my, and, and <laughs> also had a minor in reading. But the curriculum that I was exposed to, again, at the same university in Vermont, one of our Vermont universities, was entirely different. And then when I started teaching in the early 90s, I was actually teaching in St. Johnsbury, which was one of the reading recovery pilot schools. So I was working behind the glass, as some of you may, may know. Um, but then to think about how, uh, the, the pedagogical shift over the years, you know, and really what it comes down to is that balanced approach and truly analyzing data so that we are truly identifying instruction strategy with a skill gap. And teachers need the deep pockets to be able to do that, and they need to have that uh, immediate opportunity for professional reflection and growth so that they can, they can meet the needs of our kids. So along with our principals learning about what is needed in literacy, our teachers, we have some um, literacy really focused professional development happening right now, and Jackie can speak to that, where we found need is in some of the phonemic awareness when we looked at data. So Jackie's going to talk to you. Yeah, so we have one of our one of our schools is actually partnering with the Stern Center. Uh, so all teachers K1, uh, 2, and 3 are working very closely on and the principal, uh, and, and, the principal and, and, the, and our literacy coach analyzing uh, data and then matching that data with the, the appropriate instructional strategy specifically around phonemic awareness, awareness and phonics. Now we have multiple schools that serve children K through three in Essex Westford and at some of our other schools, our instructional coaches that are focused on literacy are also doing phonics pilots, if you will, with classrooms at various grade levels to, we're beginning to do the work of analyzing program versus preparation and what do our teachers need? And teachers are identifying that they need this, they need this skill set and they need this opportunity to practice that skill so that they can then meet the needs of, of our students. One of the plans that we have to continue to grow our capacity, our collective efficacy in Essex Westford, is to have teachers self-identify along the balanced literacy curriculum where they feel they need the most support. And then we will then create that professional development opportunity within Essex Westford to truly build that, that capacity. So yes, we are partnering with the Stern Center in one school right now, we're also doing uh, the work internally uh, in hopes to build that collective efficacy for all of our teachers so that they can get to the table and they can have those colleague to colleagues discuss discussions around what is most effective practice. What I've seen <coughs> in I spend 90 minutes, I spend an hour a month with each principal individually on principal issues um, and their own goals and then I'm 90 minutes a month within the school doing walkthroughs with a principal and what I've noticed in those walkthroughs and those that really focus on the phonemic awareness is unbelievable and the teachers um, confidence in the skills that they now have that they can look at so within the balanced <laughs> literacy and teaching comprehension and word work and all of that that we're giving the tools to teachers now to know what to do. And so when I speak with teachers from that are learning with the Stern Center, they feel like they have the tools now and that they don't need to send their children to someone else. Yes. No, I can do this, which is really powerful. Right. Um, and then we have a teacher at one of our schools doing a similar, not that kind of learning, but still has that confidence and the kids do too. I heard kids mm -hmm. talk about a silent E in first grade. 
Because it, yeah, yeah. If we're truly going to improve outcomes for all kids, we have to give all kids the instruction that we believe is going to improve outcomes. And where do all kids get instruction? Right? It's at that first tier in their in their classrooms, right? Especially in those early early years. Um, it, it's absolutely essential. Yeah. So one of the things <laughs> that uh, we are putting into our budget, we have re uh, invested monies. And we, our proposal to the board, and we did this last night, which they have been set up week after week after week on our literacy data, so they knew something was coming, are we have right currently two literacy coaches. We now are, um, would like four more. So we are providing each grade level, a whole K grade across the system with a coach. Mm -hmm. All first grade teachers will have a coach. This will guide them, the, the coaches will be able to guide them in that deep dive into data, looking at student work, what are the next steps in instruction, um, and they'll really focus in on that grade level, which developmentally we feel that's the best way instead of giving each school that teaches grade K to five, same number of coaches, but um, their own coach, we feel that if we do it, and Jackie had to convince me, she did a good job, um, if we have them, because I was an instructional coach at a school, and I know the impact, but um, when you have it at grade level, they can work with Jackie to make sure that it's systemic. When we look at Act 173, we're extremely excited about that because it focuses in on literacy. It's exactly what we need to be able to do and be able to be flexible with money. So we feel like in our Act 173 and with the end quality standards, this work is there. It's holding us accountable to it. So is that we believe if the agency would hold us accountable to it and support districts that need it, that's where the power. That is where the that's power where is. the rubber meets the road. Absolutely, like we have to be accountable. Yes, because again, systemically, we have yeah. a, we have a guide. We have VTMTSS. We have 173. We have the education quality standards. We have all of those guiding documents. It's up to the individual districts to analyze their needs, their needs to put resources in place that are, are adequately going to achieve those outcomes for their students. Yes. I quickly have a question. <laughs> so, this is <clears throat> this is great. Have you shared this with your other superintendents or other schools throughout the state. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, this is charged up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Chelsea, Chelsea Myers, yeah. from, for the record. Um, we, the Instructional Leadership Academy, with those learning walks that they're talking about, is through the VSA. So we have our first year of cohorts. Um, so that work is being shared amongst a specific cohort and we're working on a model for next year to disseminate that um, system and I think that's a lot of the core of that coaching and it is embedded in the instructional leadership component so that is something that is being shared with all of the superintendents yeah. to their specific reading program I would say you know, not as much other than the informal discussions with yeah. colleagues yeah. Our supervision and evaluation, which we now we revamped, and it's called the professional growth model, is based on principals giving <coughs> feedback to teachers and being in classrooms. And that's really hard when you have social and emotional learning things happening over here and they get pulled. So we've made a real focus on helping our principals to be the guiding. Teachers are number one impact for kids. Mm -hmm. Principals are next. Right. We all need to hold each other accountable so kids learn what they need to learn. And I think it's really important to state that we are not going to remediate ourselves or specialize program ourselves out of the achievement gaps that we have, not only in Essex Westbrook, but in Vermont in general, right? We really have to look at what's happening again, that first instruction, what are, what is, what are all kids getting? What are we guaranteeing that all kids are going to be able to know and be able to do as they matriculate through our through our school system? And that's really where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just, and it's really interesting to hear about what you're, what you're doing and that you set this, this lofty goal, which seems really critical. Um, so I'm curious about, uh, I'm glad to hear that you think it maps well into 173, and, and, and that's what I've been certainly hoping to, to hear. We've been hearing so much about um, screening and assessments as sometimes an obstacle to, to uh, getting certain kids certain additional supports 
early, mm-hmm. and uh, that there's seems differences of methodology, differences of opinion in terms of what assessments might be most appropriate, and then what remediation steps might be most appropriate to follow up on an assessment. Kind of leaving the remediation out of it, can you talk a little bit about screening and assessment and how that works in for pre-K and kindergarten age kids? Because I'm assuming we want to get to this point by grade three, we can't start in grade two. Right. Yeah. You want to handle that or do you want to do joint? Go. You start. Okay. So I think, again, I think, you know, clarity precedes confidence. So again, I'm going to actually start with not just assessment, but with that guaranteed viable curriculum and that essential standard work and what is it that we want all kids to know and be able to do to be effective readers, right? That, that's what it's all about. So when you have those essential standards and you're clear about where you're going, then you can match your assessment, your screening, your, you know, and your plan to those standards. What I see in systems is a current lack of understanding of truly how screeners and assessments are connected to that first instruction. And so if as a system you want to improve outcomes for kids, you have to identify screeners and assessments that are going to give you that uh, data that is actionable at a closer uh, amount of time, time span, versus waiting for an entire uh, an entire year, because by then, again, it's too late to intervene, right? We can't wait. So I think, uh, I think we have to be mindful of what we're choosing, yes. I do not see it necessarily as a barrier. I think it, I think it can be perceived as a barrier if people don't see, understand the clear connection between what data the screeners and assessments are giving us and how that is directly connected to the strategies that we are using with our kids to close those gaps mm-hmm. and skills. And that's why we feel that if we have data that we're looking at regularly, and we're working with coaches to look at that data, then a teacher won't feel like, I don't even know what to do. This child's not learning. I don't have the skills. And we will have a person there at grade level to assist and help. Now that's, we're asking a lot of our coaches, and um, I have total faith in Jackie that she will find the Right. Mm-hmm. Just, so, in, uh, for instance, an uh, uh, actual example from the field, SBAC data, so third grade SBAC data, we often look at that. It's used to report to our, to our boards, you know, sometimes to administrative teams. It's the 30,000 foot view. Uh, one of the things that we've started to do in Essex Westford is actually break down the subsets of the SBAC, so into the reading, the writing, you know, the speaking, the listening, et cetera, and then further drill down. That data is there. So the data is in the SBAC. You can drill down into reading to the exact targets at the grade levels. And then there are resources available that can help teachers match instructional strategy and activities with those with those deficits. But again, that's new for the field. Like I, I have worked in, in three districts uh, in the I don't know relatively recent past, and to do that work, it's it's a new idea. I think that, and I'm not sure. Uh, relatively new idea. There may be some that are doing it, but I don't know with that intentionality. Yeah, I agree. Good. Yes. Yeah. So one of the challenges we have is we're lay people. We're not experts in this field, um, and and sort of balancing what we're hearing. Uh, and so, for example, yesterday we um, heard testimony from Mark Seidenberg, a professor who uh, at, at, in uh, Wisconsin who wrote Language at the Speed of Light, um, which is a book that is also um, promoted by the Stern Center, at least the head of the Stern Center, and. I, I think he would look at the bullet points that are listed up there and grow a little frustrated saying, we've studied literacy for decades. We have the, the knowledge, the data, the evidence that says, you know, frankly, that structured literacy, instruction is the way to go. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 one question is, is how, you know, you guys are on a balanced literacy track, yet you have the Stern Center in there, they sort of promote this track, and how that all sort of comes out. But also, I guess the bigger question is, I mean, the statement that the research has been done, the evidence is in, we know what works and what doesn't, why do we continue to study it? Um, I, I, you, you folks are on the ground in the classroom, you're, you have a real world experience, and I, I just really want to hear how we resolve that conflict. My gut reaction is we can find research for anything we want to do. So, I feel like we were, you know, when I went to school, it was Harry, no, Dick and Jane, whatever those books were, Sally, Dick, and Jane. <laughs> and Spot. Yeah, and Spot, I loved Spot. So we were over here doing Puff. that. <laughs> and Puff. about Puff. Yeah, I don't remember Puff. Um, <laughs> so, that was like one end of the pendulum, right? And then we swayed this whole literacy, or this whole language, and forgot about 
they, we used to call it sounding out a word, right? And then it was like we were forbidden as a teacher to say sound out a word. We know there's sounds in letters. What are there, 44 sounds to our alphabet? We know that. We forgot about it, though. So it needs to be, I believe, that when we say, a, when I think about a balanced literacy, I picture a balance. And if you do two, and it has to be a balance. It can't be one or the other. Otherwise, we're going to leave some kids behind. And that's what I think we've done. We have, so we have to, to deepen the pockets, if you will, of the educators that we're charging at the first tier to meet the needs of these students. So I'm, not, I'm never going to say that there isn't a place in, in our curriculum, in our instruction, for that, that approach, that structured literacy approach, absolutely. But it has to be in balance, and it has to be, and the biggest factor in that balance are the needs of the kids in that classroom. So while that approach might work absolutely fine for one cohort, it may not work as well for another cohort. And again, if we don't balance the approach and ensure that our teachers have access to the level of expertise that they need, we are going to continue if we go too far down this one path, the fear is that we will then now develop an entire other cohort of kids down this path that we will then need to pay attention to. Whereas if we truly balance our approaches and truly look at how we're analyzing data, what are we using for assessments, and what are we expecting all kids to know and be able to do, we will then create those systems that will have that collective teacher efficacy, which more students will be achieving. Now, I'm just going to speak from a little anecdote. So I dug back into my own my own research as with a reading minor and working with children in special education and as a first grade teacher. And my binder of how to teach reading is, is thick. It's 30 years old now, but it has in it multiple tabs. And the tabs are labeled phonics instruction, comprehension. I have a whole language tab. I have a fluency tab, right? And it's an eclectic blend of strategies within each of those tabs to meet the needs of the children that were in my classroom and on my caseload. And that is what has worked over time. And I have supervised, I've been a principal, and I've supervised multiple classrooms, curriculum director now in a few districts, and I've seen that when we truly create these environments where teachers are, can be vulnerable and can say, wow, I, you know, this is something that I need to know more about so that I can effectively meet the needs of our kids, like that, that's where the power is. So acknowledging that it, you know, there are thousands of instructional approaches that can be combined to meet the needs of learners. And we have to, again, we have to acknowledge that, I think, as a system. Our Vermont MTSS guide is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. We should be held accountable to using that. Mm -hmm. It should be our yes. educational Bible right there. I, I, I wish I had brought my copy, Beth knows. So my copy is cross-referenced yes. <laughs> and color-coded with professional learning community ideology, right? Yeah. Act 173, uh, education quality standards. This is color-coded as far as how all of this links and how it fits together. And, and, how it fits our it, and how it fits, and more importantly, yes, our, our social emotional uh, initiative, how it, you know, all kids on grade level. So we've done field that guide. work. Yes. The MTSS field guide, yeah. Um, so, and I present that. It's, a, you know, it's connected. So we've heard from um, the um, Champlain Valley, mm -hmm. which is a large school district, mm -hmm. well resourced. We're hearing from Essex West Western, another Chittenden County, large, well-resourced, mm -hmm. uh, surrounded by colleges. So I'm actually not so worried about you. My concern has to do with so you guys are you you guys are pulling together. Um, I'll, I'll say a balanced program with a small b. Um, that that is including the elements that we know must be involved in, in teaching literacy. But we have other districts that are, are still struggling with that 46 and are, are trying to get a divorce. <laughs> we have districts that um, are so small. I mean, you're looking at six <coughs> coaches. Um, so Champlain Valley has four, I think, plus one in the central office. And then we have these small districts that that's, I'm, how do we, um, so you're going, you know, it's sort of a leave us alone, we've got MTSS, we're all set, and I'm going, well, you are. But there are places that aren't. So when I worked yeah. at Orange East, it was 1,700 students, and yeah. I had Newberry School, which was yeah. very small. I was able to use federal funding to have coaches. Um, we focused in, at that time, on math. 
um, and I was working, Bud Myers was doing research around the math that we were doing, we did the same mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. As Essex Westford, we just used our money different and were able to find the resources through federal funding. Yeah, and I will say so. I'm new to Essex Westford this year, but I've spent the past uh, prior to this the past five years working in the Barry Supervisory Union uh, as both a principal and as a curriculum director. And I can say that we did the same. We utilized uh, and leveraged federal dollars, title money, to increase. And this was unfortunately uh, I left, but we increased our coaching capacity for this current school year. Again, the same idea. And I also worked as a special educator in classroom teacher in Orleans Southwest. So I actually traveled from Lakeview Union Elementary School and Woodbury Elementary School, Volcutt, Craftsbury, and all of those schools. And my job was to uh, create collective teacher efficacy around working with students uh, primarily who were on the autism spectrum back then in, in a truly uh, meaningful, uh, inclusionary model. Um, and, and worked myself out of a job, actually, because it was so effective with this idea of building that. Again, I'm going to go back to what we said it earlier, collective teacher efficacy and that knowledge base of how to to truly analyze the data, the individual student data, what you have in front of you, and then match that to instructional strategy. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering this initiative of getting all children to read by the end of third grade, is that like, how old is that? Is that like, and just what, what results are you seeing? So that's one question. And then, um, yeah, last night, you know, we took public testimony um, from the public, and you know, we heard story after story from parents who were told, you know, by their relative mm -hmm. schools that their kid was fine, they were reading at grade level, and then um, by at seventh grade, <clears throat> and this was mainly dyslexia that they were talking about that their child wasn't reading fine, and. I'm just like wondering how that can be avoided or how people can trust when you say they are reading at grade level, they will be okay, that they can trust that. It's new for Essex Westford, we're a new district. So we put that into place and again, it's a bold statement. Mm -hmm. um, I felt confident as superintendent in saying that and believing wholeheartedly we can do it. Mm -hmm. um, part of the belief is in each other as well, and we need teachers to believe in each other that we can do this. And this it's only a beginning for us. Um, the work that we're doing around creating our essential standards, and uh, we said last year, we started with our professional learning communities, but they really were about gaining trust, building that culture, and this year it was like I said to Jackie when she came on board, we are going to have essential standards by the end of this year. And she said, okay, by January we will have literacy, by the end, by March we'll have math. And I'm like, all right, we're going. And yeah, so, and now we have teachers who fought it are saying this is what we need. That's true. So, and they were fighting in the beginning. We're nowhere near where we want to be. We were doing a futures protocol this morning with our leadership team, and we were pretending it was 2023. Wow, if we can get there in 2023. Um, and looked back on, Jackie had us do this thing where it was like, okay, so now you're in 2023. What were you doing in 2020 that wasn't working? Wow, that was really powerful. Mm -hmm. So we are only in the very beginning, okay. but we believe we believe <laughs> that we will do it too. We have a huge commitment and our teachers are getting on board. I love that you use the data. Yes. You know, I, as a school board member, I just hope to was just like yeah. just show me the data yeah. that the kids are mm -hmm. reaching proficiency, let's mm -hmm. say 70 percent. But I, I also agree with you. When I left education, you could drill down, mm -hmm. you know, with that data <clears throat> and get the resources and the specific skills that the kids needed. So I'm just yeah. really so excited to hear that you're utilizing that. Well, we also yeah. have opened up our data system, and I kept asking when I first was superintendent there, like, why are we looking at this data? Like, why? You can't because of FERPA. No, we can. These are our kids. Yeah. So we opened that up, and now we're like, what? is going on so that is new for our system to do and i i feel badly saying that. why mm -hmm. why so i'm just going to look That's over to ted saying. and just um fisher from the Health of education just to remind you that we are desperate for data um 
around the state, we are not, we of course can't drill down the way you can with right. your data. Right, right, right. But we can get some help um, to really get an idea of where our whole, I don't know if there's anything you can disaggregate to, to show us in terms of poverty, in terms of, but, but we're hungry for that data. For the record, Ted Fisher from my agency of education. Um, so the level uh, that Superintendent Cobb is speaking about, we can't absolutely right. not because right. of FERPA. Right. Um, but there's a lot that we can drill down into. Um, I'm not going to say on the record, but we're working on scheduling yeah. uh, of initial status update from you, and then hopefully we'll have some more updates by the end of the session as we roll out some new. Even um, in larger cohorts. You know, yeah, so when we can go fine. district by district, mm -hmm. but we can also do, I think, generally, you, 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 we're, we're still committed to coming back to have a talk about how we're doing generally. Yeah. Um, and then we're, we're working on some additional data resources that are not ready for we prime even, time yet, but we have, we'll give you an update. A, a picture of regions, particularly as we're looking at the space funding model and looking at how we might do that. I, I yeah. have question. Yes, Peter. Uh, how much of a constraint on your goals, since there's a lot of coaching and whatnot, um, is your teacher's contract in terms of available time? No. <laughs> 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 that, that wasn't too positive. <laughs> we, um, so we have early release on Tuesdays that, um, helps us to be able to work with teachers for a longer period of time on Tuesday. So it's early release, which is an hour. That's not ideal for parents at all. But that's what our constraint to our um, negotiations, that's what our contract holds us to. So we wanted two hours of time on Tuesdays to be able to do PLC work and dive into. Um, our contract doesn't actually specify times when they have to arrive and when they leave. On any given day, a principal can hold, have a faculty meeting or whatever and hold them until 7 o'clock if they wanted to, but that's not the culture. So we're trying to break that culture and one, we decided if we gave, like did a little give and take. Okay, so we'll give you an hour, but you'll give us another hour, if not, not 90 more minutes of your time. Um, it's hard on families. I get it. I almost want to say, let's stop that, and you're going to do the two hundred. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's that. And I'm also working right now with, with a few principals around their master schedule, and we're right. looking at next year. And, um, and they've identified the MTSS work at, in literacy as a, a, a definite priority. As, as you've heard today, we've identified that for our entire, our entire district. So looking at, especially uh, in kindergarten, grade one, grade two, and grade three, how we're allocating that resource of time during the school day. And so it may look a bit different for yeah. us next year to truly, so that teachers truly do have the time to do that collaboration during the school day about what's happening in their classrooms um, and do that data analysis. So I anticipate that there will be some shifts there as well. Did you have direct support from DMG? Yes, yeah, so we had a report done um, on the year, the year before we merged in 2016. Yeah. That report, we actually, our leadership team probably is still we are revisiting it and we use it all the time. We used it to do our, to create our continuous improvement plan. It's how we came up with the measurable outcome of all students. Yeah. Well, they told so us to give a percent. So there's that's worked with DMG, and I'm saying this one here, here's your MTSS. You better do a good job. <laughs> We're gonna be watching your data. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my, it's where I am feeling responsible mm -hmm. that we need to do something mm -hmm. about that rather than just handing this over to poor Representative Cooper that can barely read itself, right? I do think it is about that systemic support, though, yes. and creating a network so that whether you know, you're a superintendent or a curriculum director, a special ed director, a classroom teacher, what, what have you, what we're talking about is, is creating that collective system efficacy, right. and we're all learners, right? We're all figuring this out, but I think what we've done in Essex Westford is we've identified where we can go mm -hmm. to get the additional support. Like, I say all the time I'm not exactly sure about this you know sure I but right we're, we're trying you have to start somewhere so I think again systemically we can think about what are the resources where can people go to can the, the agency help 
in that way, um, that that might help some of the others move along. One of our interests is how do we get that <coughs> systematic yeah. coaching? Mm -hmm. I do think at the agency, someone that has a strong literacy knowledge along with how do you move a system forward? What's that systemic, what's change all about? What's transitions? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? That's hard to find um, with what they're paying at the agency. Yeah. And it, you're not going to find it. That, go take a course at UVM for three credits over the summer and come back and you'll be all set. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's about that system analysis and then that cultural and technical piece right. and marrying that right. to the individual needs of the, the district. Which is what the MG is talking about. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Dylan. Yeah, and I know we're getting tight on time, so sorry to throw this one out there, but we, we've taken some testimony and asked about definitions. They're very important. So the different proposals um, have evidence-based structure. Literacy instruction is a definition. Another contemplates research base. Another contemplates defining dyslexia. And I'm just I'm wondering, I mean, to the extent that we're looking at that big picture of how are we going to do it in all of our districts so all our kids have the same opportunities and the same support to achieve success, um, do you think the definitions work or do you think that, that there's a some caution there around how we define those terms. I think that, especially around dyslexia, not that there isn't a, a, a need, right, for our teachers, again, to increase their level of effectiveness and perhaps working in some areas, you know, with, with children who have this diagnosis. I know that um, the most recent diagnostic manual, I think DSM-5, um, has done some work around dys dyslexia and they've now, um, I actually, I have it pulled up on my phone. I have a, a, a good friend of mine is a researcher at Harvard, and I was just talking to her about this on the way here. Yeah, like, what called her? saw it yesterday. We Did you? Okay. So she was, you know, and so I was talking to her, and she said just, you know, cautionary in that, again, that idea of sort of pigeonholing us into one where DSM is actually broad in the definition of the specific learning dis disability at this point. Again, and I think it speaks to our need for that um, eclectic blend of targeted approaches dependent on the profiles of the students, right? So it's not just about this, this one categorization, but it's really about collective efficacy and understanding sort of what it all means. We're asking our teachers to do a lot. Yeah. We are, and we, the, the term uh, initiative fatigue is one that we hear, Yeah. Uh, which I think in our perspective at this point, we're looking at how do we move forward with what DMG recommending of literacy and not provide it, not send it to you as another initiative, but where's the support that's needed to make this happen? The research based, yeah. um, I think that it should be research based. It should, mm -hmm. um, there's practices out there that we know are effective. Why we don't all use them, I don't know. That, that's the whole systemic change, right? And when we do our, um, grant writing, we have to base in research base. Mm -hmm. they, we don't get approved anymore, but that's that's newer than it was. And anybody can write anything and it would get approved, but not anymore, and it has to be research based, and you have to prove, and you have to show your outcomes. Right. Which, as, you, as you pointed out, you can find research to support stuff. Right, exactly. And I, I realize we're short on time, but I also think you know the, the administration and has a, a significant responsibility to the communities in which they serve to help our teachers uh, and community as a whole understand how all of these things are truly connected together. And that makes that initiative fatigue maybe up feel a little bit less. And that's some of the work yeah. that we're also doing. And I don't know that we spoke to no. that specifically. But it really is, again, about that color coding, the MTSS, right? Mm -hmm. It is all connected. But again, Absolutely. we need to be transparent about how it's connected and then what we're going to do to move forward. Anything else? Thank you. This is you. very helpful. Yeah. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Gives us hope for the future. Okay. Oh. I don't think we have the students from the Indian schools. Good luck to you. Thank 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 you.
through all this stuff. I'll be brief. I'm pre-K, and I want to get that. I want to get so we're gonna we haven't quite finished. I'm sorry, we still have a little bit more testimony, um, but this is on pre-K. So, okay. Colin, please, thank you for your okay. shifting gears. Yeah, years. I will actually try and weave them together a little bit. All right, <laughs> bear with me. Yeah, uh, and I will keep it brief because I do recognize that I am between you and lunch, lunch. <laughs> which is and then probably the house a house floor. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so for the record, Colin Robinson, uh, political director, Vermont NEA. Um, I have some prepared testimony uh, that I believe Avery is probably going to pull up. But as it relates specifically to draft 2.1 of the pre K bill, I wanted to thank you all on behalf of our members for tackling this issue. Obviously, it's been an issue that this committee has taken on um, over the years and specifically working to address some of these technical but impactful um, changes. Um, I want to start out by just echoing, quite frankly, what um, Representative James and I spoke to yesterday, and you also heard from the folks in Washington County Mental Health earlier this morning. Um, just by way of context for the conversation about pre-K, because I think we all recognize that having access to high-quality early caring learning is incredibly impactful on children's future success in the public education system and all the challenges that students are coming to school with. Um, we need to be addressing as early as possible. Vermont has testified in previous sessions that we believe the best way to provide high quality universal pre-K is inside our public schools and it's only through that that we'll truly be able to create an equitable and sustainable system. Um, and we also, I think other colleagues from the School Boards Association and superintendents as well um, have spoken to some of the reports that you've seen that have highlighted the facts that the public programs, and some of the folks you heard from this morning spoke to this as well, um, are have higher enrollment from students that are on free or reduced lunch or on IEPs. And quite frankly, we believe it makes sense, right? Because that's where students are going to be able to receive the most comprehensive services. Um, they're going to streamline their access to their education as they move on. And uh, so with it's all kind of in that context that I'm offering comments on the draft today. So um, I want to sort of highlight a couple specific things. First of all, uh, I'll move here. Um, we're happy to see the move towards improvement of quality by moving to four stars. Um, we also, Obviously, I think you heard from folks this, this morning, and as Chair Webb has indicated, and I believe a request to JFO, you know, I think we all recognize that 10 hours is not adequate, and we'd obviously support um, increasing that. On the licensed educator, um, and this is already spoken to as well, but I just, the current draft says that private programs have a licensed educator. Um, either present or to provide regular active supervision or training of the private provider staff. And we believe that if a licensed educator is required for private program or public programs and we're trying to ensure equity across the system, that having a licensed educator providing that direct instruction is critical. And quite frankly, it's interesting um, in the echoes of the conversation around literacy and talking about making sure that our educators have the skills they need to provide effective instruction to struggling readers. Um, that we would be looking at a, a situation where we wouldn't be ensuring that folks with a licensed, um, a, the education licensure wouldn't be providing that same education um, in a public program, even if it's provided in a private setting. So that's an adjustment that we'd like to see. Um, we also uh, appreciate the draft, recognizes that it's good public policy to allow local communities through their public schools, through community engagement, have a conversation about their needs and um, lifting that requirement that they get uh, approval beyond their normal course of community conversations for possible expansion of pre-K programs. We think that is, is a positive step. Um, we do have a, a sort of echo some of the comments this morning. We do have some pauses about the bifurcation of the regulation. Uh, obviously, this has been a fraught conversation uh, for those of you who have been in this committee for um, previous sessions. And um, we, on a fundamental level, 
believe that this is a public education program um, funded through the education fund and therefore um, for some of the reasons that have been echoed previously we believe that uh, the best place and the most logical place for this is, with, is within the agency of education. Um, and the final point I'll make is that obviously you are going to continue to talk about waiting um, and having a conversation about the waiting of pre-K is one that would be valuable to have, not necessarily in the context of this bill, but as you roll forward into future, um, future sessions. So I wanted to keep it brief, high level, um, but we would obviously, we, have, we represent members who are working um, both in special education, pre-K special educators, as well as pre-K teachers, and would be happy to um, have them come in and speak to this. Um, earlier, it was spoken to um, the number of early educators and special educators and um, availability, and I think teachers generally, kind of the workforce, uh, a lot of districts are having trouble finding high quality educators to hire in generally. Um, so I think that's an important overlay for the conversation that you're you're having. So, and one final point of personal privilege, uh, I didn't get to mention it to one of the folks this morning, but as a proud graduate of Putney Central School, um, <laughs> I understand that they have a wonderful, from friends who have children in the program, a wonderful um, full day public pre-K program in my alma mater. So yeah. go Panthers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're around, so we can ask yeah. questions yeah. in the hall. Great. Um, thank you very much. Thanks all. Enjoy lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think, yeah, you know, it wasn't until like middle school that we identified.